against the backdrop of the red moon, the ominous appearance of the Dragon Valley is revealed. In the distance you can see the silhouette of a gloomy castle. In the foreground stands a young man with wings and short silver hair. Above his head is a horned halo. The dark atmosphere is further enhanced by the appearance of dragons rushing towards the guy. With their impressive appearance, they evoke a feeling of threat. However, in front of this greatness, the guy remains calm and unshakable. He speaks confidently about dragons, downplaying their importance. For him, they are insignificant. Next to the hero stands a guy with long blonde hair in blue armor. The dragon swoops down on them. He uses magic escaping from his clawed paws. The magic circle glows blue. A hero with short hair smiles excitedly. He considers dragons a good warm-up before meeting his main enemy. The guy tightens his grip on his large golden sword with a pink stone at the hilt. He pushes off the ground with incredible force and flies up. The hero finds himself in front of the dragon. The dragon is black in color and blue flames burst out of its mouth and claws. The dragon opens its mouth and prepares to attack. A magic circle appears in its mouth and its eyes light up with a blue glow. The hero smiles, his face illuminated with a magical glow. The dragon attacks with a beam of blue energy. The guy attacks back with lightning speed, cuts off the dragon's head and smiles contentedly. His sword leaves a pink trail of sparkling lightning. The dragon flies down dead. The dragon's carcass falls with a roar, breaking on the ground. His severed head lands nearby. Blood spills over the rocky ground. The hero soars triumphantly against the backdrop of the red sky and moon. He puts his sword forward, declaring that it is impossible to defeat him one-on-one. -on -one. The blade of his sword sparkles. A group of dragons flies towards the hero. The guy raises his clawed hand to his face threateningly. The hero says that the more dragons attack him at once, the easier it will be for him to defeat. A pink glowing sphere of magical energy lights up in his hand. A beam of magical energy breaks the sky above the character, raising vortices of air in a spiral. A huge golden weapon decorated with pink precious stones appears above the hero's head. The hero soars militantly against the backdrop of the dragons surrounding him. The magical energy from the weapon destroys the landscape around it. The hero's eyes light up pink and he pronounces the name of his ability. The attack is called Apocalypse. He puts his hand forward and raises his index finger up. His weapon begins to glow. The pink stones in the weapon form two glowing spheres of magical energy. A bright pink projectile erupts from the spheres. It flies through the dragons and tears them apart, leaving only charred body parts. The carcasses of dead dragons fall and lie motionless on the ground. Black clouds of smoke come from them. The hero lands on the ground. He wears golden shoes resembling the clawed paw of a dragon. On the battlefield, among the dead dragons, a purple portal opens. A colossal creature emerges from the sweat with a heavy gait, crushing the earth beneath it. White light from the portal illuminates his silhouette from behind. The creature has black skin and a massive build. There are large horns on the head. On the face there are several purple glowing eyes and a mouth with teeth protruding from it in different directions. He wears spiked shoulder pads and a long black cloak. The creature towers over the hero. The hero sarcastically addresses the creature, reproaching it for its late appearance. The hero is closest to the creature. Two young men stand behind him. One of them has blonde long hair. He is wearing blue armor and has large wings behind his back. The second guy has short pink hair and white clothes. He clutches a staff in his hands. The hero calls himself and his comrades angels. The main character addresses the creature calling him Satan and demands that he bow down before the angels. The young man rushes to attack. His eyes widen as he feels a piercing pain. An angel with long white hair pierces the hero right through with his spear. Blood runs down the weapon and drips down. The guy rudely swears at his comrade who betrayed him, calling him Michael. Blood is dripping from his mouth and the tip of a spear protrudes from his chest. Michael smiles and pulls his weapon out of the guy's body. It floats against the blue sky. 
Michael has six wings behind his back that cast a shadow on the angel, hiding his face and emotions in the darkness. The main character bleeds and flies down. He is consumed by darkness. The young man begins to slowly recover, discovering that he has lost control of his own body. Memories of being stabbed by Michael arise in his mind, and he tries to understand what the angel was aiming at when he committed this act on him. Emerging from a state of lost consciousness, the protagonist realizes that he is in free fall from a great height. A scar is visible on his back from where he was pierced with a spear. The young man's naked body tends to the ground, he screams in horror, and fear is expressed on his face. Flying over tall city buildings, a guy lands screaming in a dumpster. Having fallen into a box, he sits on garbage bags and clutches his head in pain. The young man looks up and, seeing the city buildings in front of him, tries to understand where he ended up. The sound of a frightened female voice was heard. She asked with concern in her voice what they were doing, turning to unknown persons. The main character noticed this, his face expressed bewilderment. Meanwhile, running away from unknown people, the girl steps into a puddle, raising splashes of water. A girl with dark hair and green eyes is cornered by two men, her face shows that she is scared. Unpleasant-looking men approached her. One of them is thin, short, and wears glasses, the second is tall and overweight. The short man said with a grin that the girl clearly had nowhere to run, the tall man said with the same mockery that they would not hurt her. Stepping back, the girl with an alarmed expression on her face said that these men were not people at all. The two looked at each other questioningly, the short man turned to the girl and said that since she already knew everything, she could stop stupid conversations, and the second man agreed with him, calling him by name. The man with glasses is called Henry. Henry and his partner took on their true demonic form. The girl frowned in tension and pursed her lips. A young man was heard shouting nearby, demanding to stop everything that was happening. The demons are puzzled by the fact that someone interfered in their affairs, they bared their teeth in displeasure. The young man covers the girl with his body and self-confidently tells her to stand behind her, because when it comes to demons, this is his job. The girl presses her hands to her chest in confusion and wonders if her protector is an exhibitionist. The demons are no less confused by the sight of a naked guy, asking him why he walks naked and asking him to put some clothes on. The guy just grins predatorily. His red eyes glow in the night. He is tired of the demon's chatter and calls on his rivals to attack him. Having tried to use his powers, the young man falls on bags of garbage. The main character looks at his shaking palm, his face looks painful, he realizes that he has no strength at all. The demons begin to laugh loudly, they say that the young man only knows how to talk, but in reality he is completely worthless. Henry and his partner smile contentedly, realizing that they got rid of the problem of an incompetent guy, and now they can continue their game. A crunching sound was heard, and a moment later, the two demons found themselves in the mouths of huge black snakes with glowing green eyes. The snakes easily swallowed the demons. Their heads became significantly smaller, turning into an extension of long dark hair. The timid girl transformed into a confident woman in a black, revealing, tight-fitting outfit with a cutout in the chest area, the ends of her hair suddenly became snake heads. Her bright green eyes began to glow, and a green haze hovered around her. After dealing with the demons, she firmly said that they have good taste in women, but in a fight they are absolutely helpless. She turned her gaze to the guy lying unconscious in the dumpster and wondered who he was. The hero has a nightmare about how Michael betrayed him and pierced the young man's body with his spear. The hero wakes up abruptly after a terrible dream, covered in sweat from fear. He is completely naked. The guy is wearing a thin blanket. There is a package next to him. The guy is trying to catch his breath and calm down. It's night outside. The hero sees a bar counter. The bar has a large collection of alcohol bottles. Next to the counter are high chairs with red seats. A girl with long green hair is sitting on one of the chairs. She is wearing black clothes. The girl holds a glass in her hands. 
She slowly drinks red liquid from a glass. The girl turns to the hero and calls him strong. The hero's head hurts, he holds on to it and asks the girl about the place where he is. The girl turns to the guy and says that the hero was beaten by bandits and he fainted. She says the guy was trying to protect her, so the girl decided to take him to her home. The hero wonders why he smells strange. The girl says that the hero is heavier than it seems at first glance, so she had no choice and forced her snake to carry him in her mouth. The girl remembers how the snake asks permission to swallow the main character. But the girl refuses the snake and makes it spit out the guy's body. The snake obeys. The snake is formed from the girl's hair. The girl throws a towel in the hero's face and asks the guy who he is. The hero notices under his feet a bag of clothes that the girl had prepared for the boy. The girl notices that the hero does not look like an ordinary person. The guy gets dressed. He is wearing black trousers and a red and black sweatshirt. There is a scar on the hero's torso. The girl says that she saw the hero fall from a height. She noticed that there were no injuries left on the guy. The girl finds this suspicious. The guy's gaze becomes serious. He introduces himself as the Apostle of God Morning Star Lucifer. He tells the girl the story of what happened to him. The girl starts laughing loudly. She waves it off and says that she doesn't believe his words at all. The guy sits on the floor and with a dissatisfied look says that the girl is laughing too hard at his misfortune. The girl gets up from the chair and approaches the main character. She looks down on the hero and calls him just a small fish. The guy gets up and approaches the girl with a threateningly dissatisfied look. They stand opposite each other. The girl looks confident. Suddenly, the girl's hair takes on the shape of a snake and grabs the guy, lifting him off the ground. Lucifer tries to escape from the snake's mouth, but the snake holds the guy tightly. The snake lifts the guy higher. The girl's clothes change. He asks the girl if she is a demon. He says that the girl does not have the characteristic smell of a demon. The girl says that the hero is right. She proudly introduces herself as Lilith, Satan's right hand. She says that Satan has disappeared and she is looking for him. The girl knows that shortly before Satan disappeared, he fought with someone. Lucifer interrupts Lilith and says that the girl is talking about him. It was Lucifer who fought Satan. The snake suddenly and forcefully begins to shake the guy up and down. The girl declares that this could not happen. She says that several months have passed since Satan disappeared. The girl narrows her eyes and expresses doubt that Lucifer could have fallen from heaven for so long. Lilith takes Lucifer by the chin and lifts his face towards her. The guy frowns dissatisfied and purses his lips. The girl is sure that Lucifer is an angel. The demon smiles playfully and carefully examines Lucifer's face. Then the girl turns around and walks away from the guy. She believes that Lucifer has regained his strength. Lilith waves her hand and orders the snake to get rid of the guy. The snake spits the guest out the door of Lilith's apartment. Lucifer is extremely unhappy with the current situation. The hero walks through the night streets of the city. The guy buttons up his jacket and tries to figure out what happened to him. He peers into the crowd of people passing by. Lucifer notices that demons walk along the streets of the city along with ordinary people. Suddenly, a tanned young guy bumps into Lucifer. An unfamiliar guy hides behind Lucifer in panic and asks him for help. Three men approach the young men. Strangers are aggressive. One of the men holds a bat threateningly over his shoulder. Another of the men says that the guy behind the hero's back dirty the jacket of one of them. The stranger demands Lucifer to give them the guy and not stand in the men's way. The tan guy scratches his head guiltily and clutches a red glass in his hand. Lucifer smiles listening to the men. A moment later, three beaten men lie on the ground. They groan in pain. Lucifer stands victoriously above them in a fighting pose. He dusts off his hands after a fight and says that he is able to defeat people. Lucifer turns to the guy whom he protected and inquires about his well-being. Turning around, behind him, instead of the young man, Lucifer sees a monster. On the human body, instead of a head, there is a huge toothy mouth. 
It has thousands of teeth. The monster tries to bite the hero. Its mouth slams shut a centimeter from Lucifer's face. The young man barely manages to dodge the attack backwards. Lucifer gets angry and swears at the monster, calling him a demon. The demon takes on its true appearance. The sleeve of the t-shirt rips as the demon's arm transforms. The demon resembles a carnivorous plant in its appearance. Eyes form on the demon's shoulders and green vines appear from the cracks in his arms. The demon reaches out with a clawed hand towards the hero and thanks him for his help. He says the men were bad bait. The demon directs its vines towards the hero. Lucifer reflexively raises his hands in an attempt to defend himself from the attack. Vines bind his hands and lift them above his hero head. Lucifer is captured by a demon. The demon approaches the hero and continues to entangle his body with vines. The demon says that he is very lucky because he always wanted to try angel meat. The demon carefully examines his prey. Lucifer is outraged by his helplessness. The hero wonders why he is not able to defeat a simple demon. The demon's slippery tentacles tightly grip the angel's arms and legs. Suddenly, in a moment of despair, a golden spark appears in the angel's chest. Lucifer smiles smugly and looks at the demon. In the eyes of the demon one can read fear and complete misunderstanding of the situation. Pink, sharp wings sprout from Lucifer's back and tear the demon's vines to pieces. The angel smiles ominously, his face hidden by the shadow of his hair. The demon screams in pain without limbs. The demon is thrown back and bleeds out. Lucifer assumes a fighting stance. He crosses his arms near his face. Pink long and sharp claws appear at the tips of his fingers. He has the look of a predator with eyes that glow in the dark. He spreads his arms and performs an attack called the Southern Cross. The demon's head is burned through with a pink cross symbol. Steam from the demon's scorched flesh rises into the night sky. His carcass with severed limbs and a mutilated head lies motionless on the ground. After victory, Lucifer proudly spreads her pink magical wings, which disappear after a while. A golden clot of energy flies out of the demon's body and heads towards the angel. Lucifer looks in surprise at the flying clot, which stops at the young man's chest. The clot turns into words and floats in the air in front of the hero. Lucifer learns the ancient language of heaven. He begins to read the message. The message states that the angel has been promoted to the fifth rank and receives a brand that strengthens his body. However, he does not understand what this means. Meanwhile, the demon groans in pain and tries to rise to his feet. Blood oozes from its tentacles onto the ground. He screeches past Lucifer. The guy turns around trying to stop the demon, but his path is blocked by an arriving car. The car door opens. A man in a business suit gets out of the car. He has long black hair tied into a high ponytail. Lucifer calls the man an old man and tells him not to interfere. A man in a suit lights a cigarette. He looks relaxed and starts talking to Lucifer. The stranger says that he expected to meet a simple hooligan and not the archangel himself. The man tilts his head to the side and says that the angel has lost his powers. Lucifer is excited and annoyed by the man's appearance. The hero frowns and bares his teeth. He says that the man's words sound like he knows about the main character's life situation. The guy demands the man to explain everything to him. The stranger holds a cigarette in his mouth and introduces himself. His name is Marbus, the Demon of Wisdom. He offers to answer all the angel's questions if the hero manages to defeat him in battle. Lucifer, confident in his abilities, flexes his fists. The angel is interested in the demon's proposal and is morally determined to win. The young men stand opposite each other. Lucifer flexes his muscles in preparation for battle. Marbus throws the cigarette behind his back. The battlefield is illuminated by lanterns and light from the windows of neighboring multi-story buildings. Lilith is watching the guys from the roof of one of the buildings. She sits on the edge of the roof, crossing her legs. Her hair flutters in the wind. The girl carefully watches the guys. City lights illuminate the night streets. Yellow spotlights highlight the words vivid hearts on a large billboard. 
Next to the billboard is a sign in the form of an arrow with the word park written on it. Two guys are standing opposite each other. Lucifer grins, revealing sharp teeth. He says he's heard a couple of stories about the demon of wisdom. The hero waves his hand and pink, sharp wings appear from his back. Marbus covers his face with his palm and says it looks funny. Six purple crystal diamonds with patterns in them appear between his fingers. Lucifer tries to hit the demon with his left foot. The hero shouts that his strength has returned and the demon is not a hindrance to him. Marbus blocks the blow with his hand, stopping the angel's foot in his face. He praises the hero for his strategy, strength, and skill, listing the angel's achievements. On Lucifer's hand, claws similar in structure to his wings appear. He swings them to strike. The guy makes a blow, the claws leave a pink mark in the air. He glances at the demon. Marbus ducks, trips him, and knocks his opponent down. When Lucifer falls to the ground, he manages to make another attack. The guy cuts the air with his palms in front of him. This blow passes a centimeter from the demon's face and neck. Marbus has a slight grin on his face. Lucifer tries to punch his opponent. The demon almost tenderly touches his fingers to the angel's arm and torso and says that Lucifer is still too slow. Marbus hooks the hero with his foot and with a clear movement throws the angel over his shoulder, driving him into the ground. Lucifer lies on his back amazed, but a smile appears on his face. He says the demon made a mistake because he was too focused on the hero. There is a heavy creaking of metal behind Marbus. Huge iron blocks, which the hero broke with a previous blow, fall onto the demon from above. With a crash, the demon is overwhelmed by a pile of metal. Lucifer gets up on one knee. His eyes widen in surprise when he sees that among the debris and clouds of dust and dirt raised into the air, Marbus stands without a single wound. He leaned on an iron beam sticking out of the ground and was upset that the rubble had destroyed his car. Lucifer irritably asks the demon how he was able to dodge. The demon replies that this is due to his eye of corruption ability. He raises his hand to his face again, spreading his index and middle fingers apart so that his eye is visible through it. A magical sign of six rhombuses with patterns inside is formed between the fingers. The demon says that thanks to this ability, he can foresee the most probable future. Marbus says that the angel's attacks are useless against him. Lucifer raises her hand up, and a magical pink circle appears in the sky. Dozens of arrows in the form of crosses burst out of it and fly down. Angel uses his false revelation attack, verse 8, and challenges Marbus to dodge it. The demon looks up with a little excitement. He believes that this is too large an attack in this situation. Marbus uses his eye of corruption ability to read the trajectory of the arrows. The arrows fly at the demon at high speed. Marbus swings his arm, dodging the first wave of arrows. The arrows hit the ground with a bright flash. While the demon is distracted by dodging the arrows, Lucifer takes off and runs towards the demon. He punches his opponent in the face. For the first time ever, the smile disappears from the demon's face. The powerful blow sends Marbus flying backwards. He groans and hits his back on the ground. Lucifer is pleased with himself. He smiles and says that he is going to beat the demon faster than he can react. Don't underestimate battle angels. Marbus rises from the ground and holds his injured cheek. He states with a little envy how good it is for the hero to be young. Marbus decides it's time to show off his demonic form. His boots begin to change shape and black claws appear from them. The first transformation is the dominion of the Beast King. Marbus demonstrates his abilities and poses as a predator. His left leg looks like an animal's paw with long, sharp claws. The demon raises his hand to strike. His attacks became much faster. Lucifer manages to block the blow with his hand but the force of the blow throws the angel back. The hero flies into a trash can. The iron container bends under the weight of the hero and bags of garbage fly out of it. Marbus stands on his animal legs in front of the angel. He keeps his hands in his jacket pockets and looks confident again. The demon asks the hero if the angel can use his previous trick again. 
the demon's eyes open wider. He is surprised when Lucifer gets to his feet cursing. Marba says he was going to break the angel in half with his punch, and he's surprised he didn't succeed. The demon praises the hero's resilience and decides to change battle tactics. Lucifer clenches his fists and raises his hand to strike. The demon smiles contentedly and disappears from the hero's sight. In place of Marba's, only purple fog remains. Lucifer is surprised by the demon's disappearance. He looks around to find his opponent. Suddenly, a wound from giant claws appears on Lucifer's hand. The hero feels pain and looks at his hand. He is surprised by the fresh wounds on his body. At this moment, while Lucifer was distracted, his shoulder was torn apart by invisible guests of the enemy. Blood pours from his wounds and stains the black fabric of his jacket. Lucifer grabs his shoulder, stopping the bleeding. The hero feels sharp claws gripping his neck. The guy hears the voice of a demon behind him. Marbas leans over the hero's ear and asks a question. Is an angel afraid of the thought that his life is now in the hands of a demon? Marbas slowly scratches the guy's neck with his long claws. The angel tries to hit the demon, but the demon disappears again and the hero's blow falls into the purple fog. Lucifer holds her shoulder trying to stop the bleeding. A purple mist surrounds him. A translucent image of Marbas appears in the fog, invisible to the angel. The demon smiles and pronounces the name of his second transformation. It's called the Invisible Lion. The demon asks the hero about his plans for salvation. Lucifer looks around irritably, trying to find the source of the sound and reveal the location of the enemy. An invisible demon rushes to attack, scratching the hero from different sides. The angel raises his hands to his face, trying to protect himself from the invisible claws of the enemy. Lucifer groans as claws tear at his back. The hero falls to his knees writhing in pain. Marbas stands majestically over his opponent, bowed before him. The wind blows his hair. He holds a cigarette in his animal paws. The demon considers himself the winner of the battle and says that the angel must pay for the repair of his car. The demon says that in the human world, it is rare to meet an angel and the rest of the demons will hunt for the hero. Pink claws appear on the angel's fingertips. He attacks an invisible enemy at random. Claw attacks leave pink marks in the air. The blow passes close to the demon's face. Marba smiles and gloats that the angel won't be able to hit him. Lucifer is breathing heavily, his blonde hair covering his face. The hero says that he remembers the world of people during the heyday of the Roman Empire. The fire hydrant behind the demon begins to crumble and break. Water begins to seep out of the cracks. Despite his severe wounds, Lucifer appears pleased that his plan worked. He says that although times have changed the world of people, the angel is glad that people's love for water structures has remained unchanged. Under the pressure of water, a fire hydrant explodes. Water starts pouring out of it. The demon's eyes widen in surprise when he hears the sound of water behind him. Marbas covers his face from the water with his hand. Drops of water flow down the transparent silhouette of the demon, and he understands Lucifer's plan. Now the angel knows the location of his opponent. Marbas hears the hero's threatening voice. For a second, an expression of fear appears on his face. But the demon quickly takes control of his emotions. He is still confident in himself. The demon turns around and says that even after revealing his location, the angel is still losing to him because the demon still has an invincible ability to see the future. The demon's eyes open wide, his pupils constrict, and drops of water hit his face. He sees a vague image of water drops in front of him. The demon can foresee the trajectory of every drop of water. He clenches his teeth and gets nervous. Millions of small images of water drops changing directions overload the demon's consciousness. Too much information. He clutches his head, wheezing painfully. Marbas covers one eye with his palm. But there is rage in the demon's gaze. He realizes that the angel has outsmarted him. Lucifer jumps out at the demon through the water. The hero swings his hand to strike the demon. Marbas tries to dodge, but his speed is not enough. The demon's face is illuminated from below by the pink glow of the angel's powers. 
Lucifer kicks the demon under the chin. Marbas flies back and a stream of blood comes out of his mouth. The hero smiles and gloats, asking the demon how he is feeling. Golden symbols already familiar to the young man appear in the air. Stigma received. Magic eyes. Rank increased to 15. The main character looks puzzled at the golden glow in the air and realizes that it is familiar to him. Lucifer bends over and grabs his face with his hand. The guy suddenly opens his eye, his pupil narrows and magical pink diamonds appear around his eye. Observing what happened, Marbus says that it seems that the main character has acquired the stigmata of magical eyes. Lucifer still holds his hand to his face and looks towards Marbus. Sitting on the ground with a smile, Marbus says that he gave in because he wanted to see for himself, although he does not like to admit defeat. The Demon of Wisdom explains to the main character that the most probable future for the next few seconds should now flash before his eyes. He also says that the main character may have a headache like after a hangover and says that in order to turn off the ability, he must reset the search. Lucifer holds his palm to his face, his eye glows pink, and he resets the search. The blurry image of Marbas begins to become clearer. The main character says that the ability has disappeared. The demon sits on the ground and says that Lucifer has disabled the ability. The main character says that if Marbas is called the Demon of Wisdom, then his main ability should be knowledge. The demon raises his index finger to his head and replies that he was called that because for a long time he collected tons of information about everything and everyone. Magic eyes for him are nothing more than a tool for collecting information. Using his magical eyes, Marbas examined Lucifer and discovered that his body contained the legacy of the Kai. The young man, with a questioning expression on his face, pressed his hand to his chest and asked what the Kai heritage was. Rising from the ground, Marbas replied that there was no point in discussing this in the middle of the street and invited the guy to walk to his bar. Lilith's heel appeared around the corner, the demon shouted to her that she was also going to the bar with them and asked why she was worried. The girl stood in a confident pose and said with a grin that she was not worried, but just wanted to make sure that the demon did not break this funny toy that she had picked up. Lucifer points a finger at himself in bewilderment and asks if Lilith really called him her toy, and Marbus stands behind the guy and smiles stupidly. The bar has a relaxed atmosphere. Demons sit behind the bar, and the bartenders pour them drinks. A musical group is performing on stage, and spectators have gathered around them. Visitors in demonic forms drink wine and talk. Looking around, the main character notices that demons without demonic shells are drinking and having fun. Next to him is Lilith. She says that this is not surprising, because the owner of the establishment is himself a demon. Marbus, sitting imposingly on the sofa, offers to continue the conversation about Kaya's legacy and asks Lucifer if he knows that the All-Father created the world. The main character sits opposite Marbus and answers yes. Lilith pours liquid onto the wound on the guy's shoulder. Marbus, continuing his story, says that probably before the creation of the world something already existed, and this is the Kai. This must be the heritage of God himself. Marbas shows three fingers and says that there are three such things in the world, Zuji's sword, Bizu's cloak, and Kay's stone. Lucifer sits on the couch while Lilith bandages his wounds. The main character asks if there is some kind of stone inside his body. Lilith says that this is Kay's stone and Lucifer must remember this. The guy asks what this stone will give him. Marbas shrugs and spreads his hands, answering that he doesn't know. Lucifer buttons up a new jacket and looks questioningly at Marbus. The protagonist irritably points his finger at Marbus, exclaiming that he is an old man who has lost all his wisdom because he cannot answer his question. Marbus, with the same irritability, replies that they are talking about history that happened before the creation of the world and adds that it is not so easy to find out something like that. Lucifer sits with an angry expression on his face. Lilith, sitting next to him, snaps her fingers, calling the waiter. She says that Marbas definitely knows something, because he himself said that he wanted to make sure of something. 
Marbus looks away and says that Kay's stone copies the stigmata of a defeated opponent. Meanwhile, a waiter approaches Lilith with a tray containing glasses of alcohol. Lucifer seems to be starting to understand how Kay's stone works. The girl adds that initially the stigmata can be used by its owner. Marbus agrees with the girl and says that the main character has a stone so that he will have the abilities of his opponents. Lucifer smiled and came to the conclusion that he needed to fight more often to become stronger. Lilith grins and asks the frowning Lucifer if he wants revenge for past mockery. The guy looks at the girl and replies that what is more important to him is that she helped him and so far he is grateful to her for that. The main character gets up from the couch and goes to the crowd of demons, saying that he'll probably start with the bad guys. The girl looks after him, holding a glass in her hand. Lilith leans back on the couch, saying that Lucifer is gone. Marbus swears at the guy and says that they haven't finished the conversation yet. The guy calls out to the demons, greeting them. They turn around, paying attention to him. They look at him with dissatisfied faces. With a relaxed smile, Lucifer tells them that they shouldn't walk around the human world like that. The guy introduces himself as Morning Star Lucifer. He commands the demons to show him their abilities. A group of demons look at the main character with predatory faces. They realize that there is an angel in front of them and threaten him with violence. A crowd of demons furiously attacks the guy. Pink wings appear behind the main character's back, and a magical scythe appears in his hands. To dodge the attacks of demons, Lucifer uses the ability of her magical eyes. Deftly bypassing the demon, the young man cuts his back with a scythe. The second demon, flying into the air, uses his ability. Blue magical arrows appear from his back and fly towards Lucifer. The guy blocks this attack. When the arrows hit Lucifer's scythe, they explode destroying his weapon. A broken weapon becomes unusable for battle, which disappoints the main character. He looks at the broken braid with irritation. The guy remembers one of his past battles and realizes that he has a new ability. Pink sparkles sparkle around his hand. The hand instantly turns into a clawed black paw. The guy grabs the demon's head with his paw and throws it behind him with a smug smile. Lucifer, ready for battle, stands in the midst of a crowd of furious demons rushing towards him who insult him. The guy just grins. Marbus, resting his face on his palm with a tired smile, watches the battle and wonders what this guy is doing in his establishment. Lucifer stands among the bodies of fallen demons. A golden glow emanates from next to him. The dialogue boxes say, rank raised to 18. Stigmata received. I'm announcing it. Evil eye, poison hand, resistance to spiritual attacks, hardening, monocore, freezing, balance, jump. The bloodied guy runs his hand through his hair with a smile and laughs. Lucifer stands in the spotlight. All the spotlights are directed in his direction. Around him, the stricken bodies of demons lie in unnatural poses. Lucifer looks at his palm in disappointment. He says that this time his rank did not rise much. When the hero peers into the blood on his palm, he remembers the past. Lucifer stands in his true guise as an angel. A spear protrudes from his stomach. He remembers the image of the angel who betrayed him. A blonde guy in blue armor and a golden halo above his head. The hero's face is distorted by resentment and anger. Lilith asks Lucifer about his intentions. The young man replies that he is going to find Michael and beat him. The girl remembers the hero's story about betrayal. She asks Lucifer about her relationship with Michael, the girl assumed that the angels were friends. Lucifer has his back to Lilith. He sadly says that the girl is right, the angels were friends and the hero trusted Michael. Lucifer clenches his fist furiously and irritably. He says he won't rest until he punches Michael in the face at least once. Marbus and Lilith stand behind the hero. They look at the young man in disbelief. The demons are surprised that after such betrayal and expulsion from heaven, Lucifer simply wants to beat up his former comrade. Lilith says that she has never heard of an angel being able to betray another angel. The disappearance of Satan, betrayal in the ranks of the archangels. Marbas notes that these events may be related. 
Lucifer asks Marbas a way to get back to heaven. The angel calls the demon an old man and Marbas asks him not to call him that. Marbas says that he cannot answer such a question. Angels should understand this topic better than demons. Lucifer thinks about it. He has absolutely no idea how to get back to heaven. Lilith sarcastically jokes at the hero that with his wings, Lucifer has lost his brains. The angel lunges at Lilith with his fists, but she grabs him with her hair and lifts him off the ground. Marbus is holding a phone in his hands. He says that plans to return Lucifer to heaven are temporarily on hold. Over the phone, the demon was informed that an angel had been captured in the city of Ostander. Lucifer reacts emotionally to the information and asks to be taken to this city. Marbus asks that you take this information with skepticism. The demon says that he does not work as a driver, if the angel wants to ride, he must buy his own car. Lucifer tilted his head questioningly with a naive look. The hero does not know what a car is. Lilith laughs at the hero's ignorance. She says, it will be fun to see how the angel adapts to this world. Marbas does not share her interest and wearily clutches his head. Behind them stands a dissatisfied and understanding Lucifer. It's a clear day, with silhouettes of mountains on the horizon. White clouds float across the blue sky. A red retro car is driving along an empty highway. Marbus sits behind the wheel of the car and smokes a cigarette. Lucifer sits in the back seat of the car and looks boredly at the desert landscapes. Lilith adjusts her glasses on her head and asks how far it is to go to Ostander. Marbus replies that the journey will take about two more hours. Lucifer makes himself comfortable in the back seat of the car. He puts his hands behind his head and praises people for inventing cars. Marbus says that what people like most in the world is alcohol, cigarettes, and movies. Marbus is relaxed and the wind blows his hair. Lucifer hears a noise overhead and looks up at the sky. He sees a plane and calls it a big bird. They tell him that this is a plane. Lucifer says, this is the first time he's seen it live. Lilith is thirsty and opens a water bottle. She asks Lucifer in surprise how he knows about airplanes. Lucifer looks dreamily into the sky. He says that a long time ago Michael told him that people would one day learn to fly. Lucifer frowns when talking about Michael. The hero says that with Michael the angels could talk about almost everything in the world. But now the young man is angry and does not want to talk about it. Marbas takes out a new cigarette. Lilith carefully hands the demon a lighter. Marbas asks Lucifer interestedly how his Satan fight went. Lucifer sighs tiredly. Lilith thinks to himself that Lucifer is suicidal since he decided to fight Satan. Lucifer doesn't trust his new comrades. He says that he remains in their debt, but will not tell personal information to the demons. Marbus says that all the information about the combat potential of the Archangels has long been leaked to this side. And they ask you to tell Lucifer about his comrades. Lucifer describes Gabriel's stubborn fool. The image of a strong man in armor with a dragon on his back pops up in Lucifer's memory. Uriel was silent and mysterious. His image in the memory of the hero stands in a long dark robe with a hood. The hero remembers the image of Raphael best of all. Raphael was a healer and always had Michael and Lucifer's back. He was a good-natured and sweet guy. Raphael has long pink hair and a charming smile on his face. Marbas asks to tell you about Michael. Lucifer frowns with displeasure hearing this name. Lucifer says that Michael flew faster than all the archangels. Lucifer never managed to overtake Michael. Lucifer sits in the back seat of the car, hiding his hands in his sweater pocket. He says that Michael was the only one who was brave enough to forever receive the hero of life. The angel says that of the four archangels listed, Michael was the most devoted supporter of the All-Father. The image of Michael and memories of life with the archangels in heaven appear in Lucifer's head. In Lucifer's flashback, he and Michael play chess. The background is a peaceful landscape. Raphael sits next to them and watches their game. Common walks and eternal disputes between angels. The hero also recalls their difficult battles. Lucifer, in combat form, is breathing heavily. A spiky dark demon appears behind him. 
Lucifer turns around sharply and sees the enemy rushing towards him. Lucifer gathers strength in her hand to fight back the demon when the enemy is critically close. Michael comes to his aid and cuts the demon in half. Michael looks at Lucifer proudly but with brotherly warmth. Lucifer grins back at him. They bump fists congratulating each other on their victory. Lucifer looks at the road and says that Marbus's car is quite fast but Michael would be faster. Lilith turns to Lucifer and says that he highly praises Michael. She reminds him that Lucifer was going to break Michael's face. Marbus smiles and asks Lilith not to mock their fellow traveler. He says that angels, unlike demons, are very sensitive natures. Lucifer shakes in the back seat, irritated and embarrassed. The guy covers his face with his hands and tells them to shut up and that they are pissing him off. Lilith turns to Lucifer and asks him not to be angry with them. She thought that Michael and Lucifer weren't friends from the start. Lucifer doesn't answer her, sadness is visible in his gaze. A large shadow falls from the sky onto Lucifer. The hero raises his head and looks up in surprise. Marbas looks up, noticing the intruder. The demon, with tension in his voice and face, asks Lucifer if the angel knows that in this world he is already a famous person. A huge demonic bird flies in the skies above the hero's car. The bird has black plumage on a naked avian skeleton, red eyes and fanged beak. Bones protrude from the body of the bird in different directions. The bird is not inferior in speed to the car. Lucifer calls it a hefty airplane. Lilith throws back her head and addresses the bird. She calls her came and says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Marbus shouts to the demon bird that they are in a hurry. Came asks Marbus and Lilith why the demons are traveling with the Archangel and says that he will not allow them to continue. Lucifer, unable to tolerate such insolence of an uninvited guest, sharply pushes away from the car and soars up. The car by inertia shrinks into the ground and then jumps up, scaring Marbus at the wheel. Lucifer, with sparkling pink eyes, invites Cain to play his game. From the car, Lilith playfully shouts to Lucifer that if the angel tears his suit, he will wear a t-shirt with a sea urchin. Cain screams as Lucifer scratches his torso with her claws. Without interrupting the dialogue with Lilith, the hero asks her what a sea urchin is. There is not even a scratch left on the demon bird. She mockingly calls Lucifer's attacks just tickles. Lucifer mysteriously says that this hit was quite enough. Lucifer loses altitude and comically flies down. With its fall, Lucifer raises a cloud of dust. Lilith and Marbas just silently watch the battle from the sidelines. Lucifer is on his knees, stunned by his fall. Behind him, Lilith and Marbas are discussing that Lucifer has not yet received the skill that allows him to fly. But they praise his excellent jump. Lilith asks the hero how he plans to fight Cain if he can't even fly. Lucifer pretends that she didn't hear her question. He asks a counter question, which interests the hero more, what exactly is a sea urchin? Cain begins to laugh at Lucifer's lack of knowledge about the land. Lucifer gives the bird an expectant and terrifying look. Cain tries to say Lucifer's full name, but at this moment the demon's body is covered in purple blisters. These bubbles begin to eat away at his flesh. The bird screams painfully and falls to the ground behind the hero. Lucifer calls this ability Poison Hand. He turns around and wishes came a good rest. A victorious golden glow appears in the air. Lucifer gains a new ability. The name of the Strong Claws ability appears in the dialogue box. Lucifer, dissatisfied with the new ability, begins to scold Kame. He says he would prefer the supersonic flight ability of a bird. Marbas, smoking from behind, asks where the hero saw birds flying at the speed of sound. Lilith consoles Lucifer and tells him that Kame's claws are capable of cutting any matter in this world. Lucifer turns to his comrades and looks at them in surprise and alarm. The guy is amazed by their indifference. He says that they do not care at all that the angel is killing their relatives. Marbas and Lilith silently look at each other. And then they ask in unison why this should bother them. There are bloodthirsty grins on their faces. 
they remind Lucifer that his new companions are bloodthirsty demons, and demons are not as sentimental as angels. Lucifer is surprised and confused by their answer. He winces and blushes slightly. The guy would like to punch the demons, but they remind him that the hero cannot cope without them. Marbus drives the car and Lilith provides Lucifer with clothes. The angel cannot object to this and only grunts in irritation. The red car is still driving along the empty road. Lucifer rests his cheek on his hand and says he's bored. With an indifferent look, he looks into the distance, the wind blows his hair. He says that at first it was interesting, but the same views make him sad. Marbas replies that they only have to drive for two hours and asks the guy if he has any ideas on how to kill time. The guy answers, a battle with a demon. Lilith, straightening her hair, says that soon they will be in place. The girl says that Ostander belongs to Satanasia. Marbas added that Satanasia's people have sealed off the city since they captured the angel. The girl claims that it will be problematic if they keep the angel. She already tried to infiltrate their base and steal something, but it didn't work out. Marbus says that fortunately his older brother is their boss and thought that he really didn't want to meet him. He also said that if they did not make unnecessary noise, they would be allowed to see the prisoner. Meanwhile, Lucifer was distracted by something. He didn't listen at all to what Marbus was saying. A white car with an open body drove next to them. There are two tied-up children sitting in the back. A boy with dark hair in a white jacket and a girl with blonde hair in a black dress look at Lucifer in fear. The guy frowns and jumps out of the car a moment later, while Marbus sits relaxed behind the wheel with a cigarette in his mouth. The demon tells the young man not to pay attention to the children because they are just food for Satanasia. As Lucifer jumps, he crushes the roof of a white car with his foot. The roof immediately bends under the guy's weight and the glass from the windows shatters in different directions. The main character grabs the children, pulling them out of the car. The car turns over on its side. Marbas watches this in horror, the cigarette falls from his mouth. Lucifer frees the children from the ropes as the car explodes behind him. The young man asks the boy and girl if they are okay, to which they respond positively. He takes the boy in his arms, trying to put him in the red car, and asks the children what happened to their parents, to which they say that they do not remember. Marbas calls out to the guy in alarm, but he doesn't listen. Clutching her head and closing her eyes, Lilith grins. She forgot that it is natural for angels to protect children, but they can be punished for stealing food from a higher demon. Finally, Marbas managed to call out to the guy. Lucifer turns around, turning his attention to the demon. Marbas points his finger at Lucifer and displeasedly tells him to take the children and run away from here because after such an act the demon will not be able to guarantee his safety. The demon says with displeasure that if the guy had not tried to save the children, he would have easily been allowed to see the prisoner, but now this is impossible, Lucifer has become the main target for Satanasia. The main character replies that saving children is a natural thing. Marbus asked if the guy would now take the children with him. Their argument is interrupted by Lilith. Her face is tense, she says that Satanasia's people are already on their way. She thinks what should they do now. Marbus irritably presses his palm to his forehead, he asks Lucifer if he wants to meet the angel without abandoning the saved children. The guy answers positively. The demon tells him to remain silent if he wants him to help him. Lucifer frowns but agrees. The demon easily pushes the young man with his palm. Now the guy is lying on his back, Marbas is kneeling over him with an annoyed smile, telling him to be a good boy and lie still. Lucifer lies with his chest on the ground. His hands are tied and his mouth is covered with a cloth. The guy frowns and looks up. A man sits above him in the shadows, his eyes covered by his bangs. The man calls out to Marbas, saying that he has captured the angel who was trying to steal their offering. The silhouette of a man sits on a throne, imposingly resting his cheek on his hand. Next to him are three of his subjects, a creature with six eyes that looks like an owl, a werewolf with purple eyes and red fur, and a red-haired guy in a hat. 
The man says that he usually does not appear at such meetings, but Marbas brought him a very worthy gift. Marbas looks up at his interlocutor. Marbas is confident that Lucifer is much stronger than it might seem at first glance, and such an offering will definitely please Mr. P Satanasia. However, the guy on the floor responds with an angry look and curses at Marbus in his thoughts. Coming closer to the young man, the demon presses his head to the floor and whispers to him to calm down, because all this is just a game, and he must continue to play his role, because it was because of him that this situation arose. Their only chance to see the prisoner is to defeat Satanasia. Lucifer, although he understands the seriousness of the situation, feels furious. Sitting in the shadows, Satanasia states that Lucifer is an interesting prey and that the other angel has crystallized himself in such a way that they are powerless against him. In contrast, Lucifer possesses a valuable source of power. Satanasia extended a tentacle that grew from his body in the direction of the guy. Carefully sliding under the fabric on the face of the lying Lucifer, the tentacle tore it, freeing the young man's mouth. Continuing his monologue, Satanasia emphasized that the main advantage in his fortress is strength, and called on the guy to show what he is capable of. Lucifer, rising to his knees, easily broke the ropes that tied his hands, and pink wings appeared behind his back. The main character, with a playful smile on his face, declared that he was ready for a fight. Satanasia addressed three of his subordinates, Ammon, Barbados, and Pruflas. He ordered them to deal with the guy. Lucifer stands in a fighting stance. Three of Mr. G Satanasia's subordinates pounced on him, flying into the air. Meanwhile, Lilith and Marbas decided to take the children to safety. With worry on their faces, they watched the battle unfold. Marbas says with excitement that they need to leave here. Lilith worries whether everything will be all right with the young man, but if they do not leave the fortress now, they themselves will come under attack. Lucifer activates the magic eye's ability. He is clearly looking forward to the upcoming battle, it is fun for him. Baring his teeth, the werewolf let out a threatening roar. Without being confused, the main character closed his mouth with a sharp movement, hitting him in the jaw with his palm. He knocked the werewolf to the ground, he fell on his back, breaking the floor underneath him. At that same second, pink magical swords stabbed into the creature, tearing its flesh. The guy, having dealt with Ammon, became the target of an attack from Pruflas. A fiery owl was approaching at breakneck speed, heading straight for the main character. But despite the danger, the young man raised his palm. A transformation began to occur, the hand began to become covered with frost, and the owl's body was immediately enveloped in a thick layer of ice. Watching the battle, Satanasia was surprised at how the guy froze the flame itself. He doesn't understand why Lucifer has so much stigma. Meanwhile, Barbados drew a bow loaded with electric arrows. As soon as the bowstring was released, the arrows, sparkling like lightning, instantly headed towards the main character. With an evil smile, Lucifer easily repelled the attack, decisively closing the distance between them. Barbados, in bewilderment, grabbed the hilt of his sword, which hung on his belt. The angel and demon swords collided with force, causing them to vibrate in the air. Suddenly, Barbados' sword broke into two pieces. Smirking, the guy informed his enemy that the invincible Lucifer was standing in front of him. Satanasia's pupils, hidden in the shadows, instantly shrank, revealing his stupefaction at the situation. Watching what is happening, Lilith and Marbas are talking sarcastically, discussing the fact that the main character does not know how to think at all, and perhaps his brain is very small. Lucifer perfectly heard the unflattering comments addressed to him, and he is extremely outraged. Barbados began to back away. He picked up the bodies of his allies who lay unconscious and jumped up, retreating. A golden glow appeared around the hero again. The dialogue boxes say, Stigmata received. Ignition endurance. The guy is not happy with this set of stigmata, but he has come to terms with it. The main character is facing Satanasia. He challenges him, claiming that he is next in line to be defeated. 
The young man begins to activate the ability of his magical eyes, but does not have time because at the same moment sharp tentacles pierce his body, piercing him right through. The guy's face expresses pain, drops of blood come out of his mouth. Lilith and Marba's watch in horror. Satanasia, rising from his throne, went to the angel lying on the floor, who was bleeding. A man with black hair and blue eyes looks at the young man's body with contempt. He says that the winged little angel does not even dare to hope that he can defeat the demon general with his pitiful powers. Lucifer lies on the floor with severe wounds. Satanasia rises above him. The scarlet blood of an angel spills across the floor tiles. Lucifer, breathing heavily, wonders how Satanasia managed to get to him unnoticed. Alarmed and frowning, Marbas watches what is happening. He doesn't understand why Lucifer's magic I didn't work. Satanasia calls Marbas by name. A tentacle appears from the demon's face and with a sharp movement pulls Marbas towards Satanasia. Satanasia grabs the demon's chin and carefully studies his face. He holds his brother tightly with his tentacle. Satanasia sees that Marbus's magic eye is in place, and he concludes that Lucifer did not receive this ability from the demon of wisdom. Satanasia's pupils narrow sharply, and he looks Marbus right in the face with an eerie gaze. He says in an intimidating tone that he already thought that Marbus was causing Lucifer to rip out his eyeballs. He lets go of Marbus's face and turns away from his brother. Marbas backs away from him in irritation, covering his face with his hand. Satanasia says he can't figure out where Lucifer got this ability from. He reveals that he knows the weaknesses of this ability due to the fact that he and Marbas often quarreled as children. Lucifer, barely conscious, watches them. He is trying to get up. Blood from his wounds pours onto the cold stone floor. Satanasia's tentacle hits Lucifer in the face, throwing him onto his back. Satanasia powerfully says that he did not allow the hero to get up. Lilith looks furiously at Satanasia. The girl's hair is highlighted in green. She comes forward in her demonic form and stands in front of Lucifer, blocking Satanasia's path. Lilith turns to the demon and says that she was the first to find Lucifer and will not let him be killed. Bloodied and exhausted, Lucifer lies behind her. Satanasia orders Lilith not to interfere in their fight. Lilith says that Lucifer is the key that will lead her to Satan and she must protect the angel. The girl's hair is in combat readiness aimed at the demon. Satanasia says that he sees Lucifer only as an enemy of Lord Satan. Lilith tries to protect Lucifer. She reveals that the angel remembers nothing about the battle with Satan and that his own fellow angels tried to kill Lucifer. Satanasia's eyes glow purple and he attacks Lilith with a tentacle. The girl is thrown to the ground. Lucifer watches their fight with all his might. Satanasia approaches the girl and says that an angel capable of copying the powers of demons poses a potential threat. Satanasia says that the hero must be killed here and now. His voice becomes menacingly dangerous. He tells Lilith if the girl gets in his way, he will kill her. Satanasia's tentacles are directed towards Lilith lying on the ground. Lilith humbly closes her eyes. The tentacles pierce into the flesh with a characteristic sound. But Lilith does not feel pain and opens her eyes in surprise. Lucifer lies above her, covering the girl with his back like a shield. His body is pierced by several sharp tentacles. There is angel blood everywhere. He looks at the demon with fury. Lilith is shocked by the hero's action and looks at Lucifer with excitement. She asks the angel what he is doing, worrying about his condition. Lucifer tells her to shut up and replies that this is his fight with Satanasia. But at the same moment he falls exhausted to the floor, losing consciousness. Satanasia calls the tentacles closer to her and tells Lilith that her life has been saved. Marbas watches the battle anxiously. He realized how Satanasia's attacks worked, but it was too late. Lilith worriedly unbuttons Lucifer's jacket, checking his condition. The girl is amazed by the number of wounds on the angel's body. Her hands clutch Lucifer's sweater and begin to shake. The little boy silently presses his hand to his chest and runs forward. Marbas shouts to him, but does not have time to stop him. 
Lucifer's bloody body lies on Lilith's lap. The boy kneels in front of Lucifer and points his palms towards him. A warm yellow light appears from the child's palms. Lilith looks in surprise first at Lucifer and then at the boy. A sacred golden glow illuminates the hero's skin. White bright sparks sparkle from his body and face. Lilith looks at Lucifer and then suddenly grabs the boy with her hair and jumps with him away from the hero. Satanasia covers her face from the bright, blinding light. There is a flash as bright as the sun, forcing everyone to cover their eyes. When the light becomes less bright, Lilith slowly begins to open her eyes. Marbas and Satanasia look at Lucifer in amazement. Lilith holds back her flying hair and looks at Lucifer. Snow-white feathers float in front of her face. She looks at Lucifer and sees that real large snow-white angel wings have grown from his back. Pink plumage spreads across his arms and shoulders, and all the deep wounds on his body disappeared. The hero looks at Lilith. His face is angelically pure and beautiful. There is no trace of the hero's usual bestial smile. Lilith behind Lucifer looks in amazement at his new wings. The angel examines himself and is surprised at the lightness of his body. Lucifer looks at her wings and is surprised by their shape. He remembers for sure that they were never like this. His train of thoughts is interrupted by Marbus's cry. The demon shouts to the hero about Satanasia's ability to interfere with space. Marbus tells Lucifer to watch his movements. Satanasia's tentacles appear from a black spatial hole near Marbus's face and are about to grab the demon. But Lucifer manages to react and grab the tentacle first. He pushes Marbus aside. Satanasia addresses Marbus and calls him careless. Marbus smiles guiltily and asks his older brother for forgiveness. He says that betrayal was not part of his original plans, but a real miracle is happening before their eyes. Lucifer tears off a tentacle and throws a piece behind his back. The angel smiles contentedly. Marbus bends over and grabs his head with his hand, shouting that he wants to know what else Lucifer is capable of. This thirst for knowledge cannot be controlled. The demon is obsessed with this idea. Satanasia looks at his brother with contempt and asks him, Is this knowledge worth the risk of dying and facing emptiness? Marbas looks at Satanasia with a crazy look. He says that it is right for a demon to indulge his desires and asks his brother to be understanding. He tells his brother that he too is indulging his desire to control everything. Satanasia denies this. He releases all his power. Several huge tentacles appear behind his back. His image looks majestic and frightening, his eyes and tentacles are illuminated in purple. Lucifer challenges Satanasia to battle, calling him a vile sadist. Satanasia puts his hand on his sword and five black spatial portals appear behind the demon, into which tentacles penetrate. Lucifer uses the ability of her eyes and anticipates the enemy's attack. Magic diamonds appear and sparkle with pink light near the angel's eye. Portals open next to him and demon tentacles burst out of them. Lucifer grabs them with his bare hands before they can injure him. He squeezes the tentacle tightly with his hand. Blood from the tentacle stains the guy's hand. He tears off the tentacles and throws them aside. The angel looks up at Satanasia, smiles and rushes towards him. The demon crosses his hands in front of him and takes out his two swords. His face is in shadow and his eyes glow terribly. He holds crossed swords in front of him and takes a defensive pose. Lucifer raises his hand to strike. The energy of the angel's power is concentrated in pink light at his hand. On the hero's face, there is a predatory smile of sharp teeth. The force of the impact causes Lucifer to demolish the wall of the stone tower. Parts of the tower fly apart in different directions as if from an explosion. Among the flying debris and raised dust, a demon appears who managed to dodge the attack. He looks forward ahead of him. Lucifer appears in front of him like a bird of prey. He swoops down on Satanasia and grabs his arm. The guys look at each other angrily. Against the background of the starry sky, from the collision of an angel with a demon, a huge pink cross appears. A bright pink beam hits the ground from it. A bright flash touches the ground and destroys the surface. 
Stones fly in different directions. Lucifer appears from under the rising fog of dust and looks for his opponent. Clear footsteps can be heard from the thick smog of dust. Satanasia comes out of the fog with a quick step. He's no longer wearing a jacket. He holds swords in both hands and walks towards the angel with rage and a confident step. A ray of sun shines on the tip of one of his swords. Lucifer flaps his wings and two magical pink swords appear in his hands. Satanasia throws the sword towards the angel. Lucifer jumps back and prepares to block the attack. He is surprised when a portal appears between him and the sword and the demon's sword flies inside the portal. The hero barely has time to dodge a fatal blow to the head when a similar portal opens behind him and the same sword flies out of it. Phaetonatia approaches the angel and intercepts the sword flying from the portal. His clothes are all covered in dust, and the look burns with hatred for the angel. Lucifer successfully blocks the demon's sword. The clang of steel sounds in the angel's ear. Satanasia places her swords on the floor and drives them forward with force, cutting through the ground in front of her and attacks Lucifer. The angel repels the demon's attack with his swords. He looks down and sees huge cracks in the ground that were left after the demon's attack. Lucifer throws his head back. The Satanasia sword flashes a centimeter from his thin neck. The demon looks irritated and exhausted. He's breathing heavily and beads of sweat are running down his face. Lucifer grins seeing the demon state and asks if he is already tired. The hero suddenly rushes forward to attack the demon. Satanasia manages to put her swords forward defensively. The enemy's swords began to clang against each other. There is a fresh scratch on Lucifer's face from which blood flows. However, the angel's face shines with a satisfied smile. Drops of blood fall to the ground. Lucifer managed to wound Satanasia. On the right side of the demon's body, a wound opens from which blood flows. The demon's blood also stains the ground. This mistake of Satanasia makes him furious. The demon, without blinking, looks at Lucifer from under his brows and his eyes glow with the desire for retribution. He attacks the angel. Their swords cross. Lucifer's swords emit pink flashes at the points of impact. They stand close to each other. Satanasia stands tall and looks into the angel's face with a calm face. Lucifer, gritting his teeth, looks back into the demon's eyes. A trickle of blood flows from a wound on his cheek. The angel looks down at the weapon. He lifts his leg and breaks their swords with a strong kick. With the second sword, he pushes the demon away from him and immediately knees him under the chin. A stream of blood shoots out of the demon's mouth. The demon, thrown back, manages to raise his sword with the tip up. Lucifer tilts his head to the side, preventing the demon's sword from cutting him. The demon raises the whole sword above his head. In his second hand, the broken half of the sword is no longer suitable for battle. He looks down at his feet, his face hidden by his hair. The demon's eyes are hidden by his bangs and blood is dripping from his face. He laughs quietly. Satanasia thrusts his blade forward. The demon shouts that the angel should not flatter himself. His look is crazy. A ray of sun glare reflects on the surface of the demon's blade. Lucifer shouts at the demon to shut up and start attacking. The angel puts his hand on his chest. He calls the demon a vile and says that Satanasia should be grateful to him that the angel does not hold a grudge against him for the fact that the demon made holes in his body. Lucifer demands to give him the angel that Satanasia captured. The demon looks at the hero with a smile and challenges him. If an angel wants to take away his comrade, he must not let the demon get bored in the duel. Lucifer looks at Satanasia and says that demons love to indulge in hedonism too much. Lucifer flies into the sky in front of the demon. The hero remembers Satanasia's words about how the demon likes strong guys. Lucifer poses defiantly, throwing his arms above his head and joking with the demon. He, with a smile on his face, asks the demon not to accidentally fall in love with him. Lucifer flaps his wings and spreads his arms. A pink magic circle forms above his head. A huge golden cannon appears in the center of the circle. This weapon is much larger than Satanasia's fortress. The cannon sparks with pink lightning. 
a pink sphere of energy begins to appear at the base of the weapon. Lucifer snaps his fingers and says the phrase Johannes Ray Anatos. He gently points his finger at Satanasia. A bright flash lights up above the demon's head. Satanasia looks above himself with admiration and a smile on his face. The cannon glows and shoots down with incredible power. A beam of pink energy crashes into Satanasia's fortress. A broken sword with a golden hilt lies on the ground. The ruins of the destroyed tower are scattered everywhere behind. Marbas and Lilith exit the tower through the hole. There are rubble of a building under their feet. They look at the sky in fascination. Marbas analyzes Lucifer's actions and begins to reason out loud. Demons are complete, perfect beings and even death does not frighten them. Lilith picks up Marbus's reasoning. Due to the perfection of demons, no race is able to bear their children. After all, demons do not need to evolve and develop, they are already perfect. Lilith says that because of this, the powers granted to them at birth are their limit. Unearthly beings are not capable of development. But Lucifer became an exception to the rule. The hero can combine the powers of demons and angels. Lilith and Marbas look up to Lucifer. The hero soars in the sky. A dialogue box appears in which it is written that Lucifer has reached rank 40 and received new stigmata. The hero smiles contentedly and says that he has become stronger. The wings behind the angel's back begin to disappear. The hero looks in panic at the disappearing image of his new wings. Lucifer, surrounded by white feathers, flies down to the ground and screams furiously. As the angel falls, Lilith's demonic hair is caught and gently lowered down. Lucifer fearfully presses his hands to his chest and furtively looks at the girl. She silently stands with her back to him, arms crossed over her chest. Lilith then looks at the angel and says that they are now even counting on saving her life. The hero looks at her in surprise and then agrees with this statement. He looks down and notices a little boy standing next to a girl. Lucifer looks at the child and memories emerge in his memory. The boy's eyes glow with a golden light. Lucifer remembers how the boy saved him, but he is unable to remember his face. The guy is surprised and scratches his head. A little girl in a black dress silently stares at Lucifer. A crash is heard under Lucifer's feet. Lucifer looks down and sees a huge crack in the floor. Under the ground, there is an ice block bound with chains. Inside the ice block is the silhouette of a long-haired guy. Lucifer looks down at the guy's silhouette and recognizes him as Michael. Lucifer, Lilith, Marbas, and two children go down and head towards Michael. A block of ice is chained and chained to the ceiling. Lucifer stands in front of Michael and examines him carefully. Michael in modern clothes, in a white turtleneck and jacket. Lucifer looks at the angel incredulously, tilting his head to the side. He reaches out and taps the ice with his fingers. A familiar voice calls out, telling him to stop. The hero moves in surprise and takes a step back when a portal opens in front of him. A bloodied Satanasia emerges from the portal, holding a month in his hand. He says that Michael is his property and that Lucifer should not touch him. Lucifer, irritated by the appearance of his enemy, makes a face. He calls the demon a vile and says that he expected him to escape from the attack using portals. Marbas is shocked by his brother's wounds. The demon is missing his left arm and blood is pouring from a fresh wound. Satanasia tells his brother that the holy ray incinerated his hand. The fastening chains above Satanasia's head begin to crack. The fastenings disappear from the ceiling and behind the demon's back a block of ice breaks. Lucifer and Satanasia look at the place where the captive angel was. But they don't see anyone. Michael disappeared. In its place on the floor lie only shards of ice and long chains. Two white feathers from angel wings floated smoothly in the air. Lucifer looks at them with irritation. He says that Michael ran away a long time ago, leaving behind just an illusion. Satanasia tightly grips the hilt of her sword with her hand, realizing that the angel has fooled them with a fake. He looks down in frustration. Cursing, Satanasia says that Michael was the only clue to Lord Satan's whereabouts. 
Lilith looks at Satanasia puzzled. The girl asks what he means, because he was ready to kill Lucifer without even thinking that he could also be a clue. Marbas looks at his older brother standing in front of him. He asks what exactly Satanasia knows. The demon offers his older brother to treat his wounds and claims that starting a fight now would be pointless. Satanasia does not answer, he only looks towards Lucifer with anger. Lucifer gives him the same aggressive look. Looking at Satanasia, the protagonist extends his hand to Marbus. The guy is tired of the demon not telling them anything. He released his pink magical claws and put them towards Marba's neck. He threatened that if Satanasia did not tell everything he knew, then his younger brother would suffer. Marbas indifferently tells the protagonist that such a pathetic threat would never have any effect on Satanasia. However, Satanasia sheathes his sword. The main character does the same and frees Marbas. Marbas is shocked that his older brother showed affection towards him. Lilith crossed her arms and said with a frown that Marbas was surprisingly stupid for not noticing that Satanasia only treated him and his comrades with kindness despite the fact that they were demons. Ammon, Barbados, and Pruflas peek out from around the corner behind Lilith. Marbas recalls moments in which Satanasia treated him cruelly and the demon's face twisted into an uncomprehending grimace. Satanasia sits on the floor, with Barbados and Marbas bending over him, who are treating and bandaging his wounds. Marbas holds Satanasia's shoulder with his hand and says that the bandaged wounds will heal in a couple of days, the main thing is not to strain. Satanasia agrees with this. Barbados has his back to Lucifer. He rolls out the sleeves of his jacket and says that Mr. Satanasia has made this fortress a shelter for demons who are not able to take on human form, such as Ammon. Barbados turns sharply to face Lucifer, saying that the main character is an enemy for Mr. No Satanasia and this will come back to haunt him. Lucifer looked at Barbados with contempt. Satanasia, sitting on the floor, told Barbados not to talk too much and calm down. Barbados humbly agreed. Satanasia says that soon after Lord Satan disappeared, the deity to whom the angels swore an oath of allegiance also disappeared. Lucifer raises an eyebrow in amazement. Satanasia, continuing the story, says that only high-ranking demons who personally received orders from Lord Satan know about this. Lilith frowns, she has never heard of this. Satanasia remembers that the girl was the first to go in search of Satan, but since Satanasia always disliked her, he decided not to share this information with her. Lilith and Satanasia clearly don't like each other. Lilith said in a sarcastic manner that she would kill him. After this story, Lucifer exhales tensely. He realized that the All-Father had also disappeared, so no one was looking for the main character. Compared to the disappearance of a deity, his situation was worth nothing. Satanasia added that this is not just about God. Gradually more and more angels began to fall on earth. Not only Lucifer and Michael, most of the angels are already on earth. Unaware of the situation, the demons came to the surface to fight the angels. Noticing this anomaly, the first thing they did was search for the archangels. Without Lord Satan, the demons had lost their leader, and it was vital to create a new government before his return to reason with the demons. Turning to Satanasia, Marbas believes that he was trying to become an active leader for everyone, and at the same time was hunting for Michael and Lucifer, because he hoped that one of the angels knew something for sure. Satanasia looks into the void and says that this angel knows nothing anyway, and it is useless to interrogate him. Satanasia thought that he wanted to make Lucifer a trophy that would represent his power. The dialogue box says, Angel Conqueror Number One. We guarantee two days off and favorable conditions for our employees. Cozy workplaces. Lucifer is very indignant and exclaims that he will remember this Satanasia. Lilith tilts her head questioningly. She asks what happened to the rest of the top because they haven't been in touch for a long time. Marbas believes they are now desperately hunting for angels. Lucifer adds that while they are chatting here, Raphael and the other angels may end up in the hands of demons. Lilith looks at Lucifer with a sly smile, asking if he is worried about Michael. 
Lucifer gloomily tells her that Michael is definitely safe because he is a master of escape. Lucifer points an angry finger at Satanasia and Marbus. He offendedly asks why Marbus calls himself the Demon of Wisdom, although he himself knows nothing. He says that Marbus and Satanasia are worth each other. Marbus looks confused and Satanasia looks indifferent. Satanasia reports that he tried many times to tell his younger brother this information, but he did not answer his calls. Marbus guiltily stated that Satanasia's calls gave him goosebumps. Lucifer intervenes in the dialogue. He says the brothers have terrible communication skills. The main character resolutely clenches his hand in a fist and voices a new plan to find the demonic elite and knock out all the information from them by force. Marbus displeasedly says that if for the main character communication is breaking faces, then he will not listen to these moral teachings. The angel and the demon swear and cling to each other while Lilith talks on the phone. Answering the caller, she says that she knows approximately where Asteroth is now, and she needs to occupy herself with something until Lord Satan returns. The main character approaches Satanasia sitting on the floor. The guy looks down at him and points his finger at him. This time the issue between them is closed, but if Satanasia again poses a threat to children or angels, then Lucifer will deal with him. Behind the main character stands a boy with dark hair, his golden eyes sparkling in the darkness. No one noticed this except Marbus. His eyes widened in shock. He remembered that the child had done something. All of Lucifer's wounds were instantly healed as soon as the boy touched him, as if it had awakened his evolution. Marbus does not understand why no one except him says anything about what happened, he thinks that only he remembers it. Lilith and Lucifer do not pay any attention to the worried Marbus. After finishing the phone conversation, Lilith hangs up the call. She smiles and says that she has agreed on everything and calls on her comrades to leave. The girl turns around and leaves, Marbus, standing behind her, reaches out to her to call out to her, but does not dare to do so. Lucifer looks at the large private jet with admiration. He flaps his pink wings like a happy puppy wagging his tail in delight. A smiling Lilith stands next to him. A stately man in a business suit comes out of the plane, he spreads his arms, expecting a welcoming hug. Lilith rises to meet him. The man exclaims that he missed the girl and flew 7,000 knots to meet her. Lilith greets the man, addressing him as Thomas. Moving closer to the man, she gently kisses him on the lips. Lucifer stands behind them, waiting for Lilith to introduce a man to them. The girl clings to the man, hugging him. Her eyes sparkle with a green demonic light. She replies that this is one of her minions, and it is always convenient to have people with connections on hand. The girl says that Asteroth is on the other side of the country and they won't get there in an antique, hinting at the red Marbus car. The demon looks disappointed. He calls Barbados, asking him to look after his car while Lucifer boards the plane. When the angel comes on board, he notices the luxurious interior inside. He sits contentedly on the sofa, saying that it's surprisingly spacious here. Everyone takes their place and Lucifer discovers Satanasia among his comrades. The main character angrily asks him what he is doing on board the plane. Satanasia relaxedly replies that he will not be able to sleep peacefully if he leaves Marbas next to such a harmful angel as Lucifer. Lucifer asks if Satanasia is too protective of his little brother, but Marbas adds that he is no longer little and Satanasia should return home. Satanasia calmly takes a sip of tea, adding that he doesn't want to admit it, but from this day on Lucifer is his subordinate. The angel angrily reminds the demon that he defeated him in battle, and Lilith says that since the demon does not know how to accept defeat, then he should better keep quiet. Satanasia casts a fearful glance at the angel and tells him that he better humble himself, but the protagonist abruptly interrupts him, forcing him into silence. Lucifer sat on the couch and looked at Satanasia disapprovingly. Satanasia himself looked calm and did not show any emotion. Sitting on the couch with Lucifer was Lilith, who looked unhappy. Next to Satanasia sat his brother Marbuz, who lowered his head in embarrassment and thought about the heavy atmosphere here. 
Lilith looked at the confused Marbas and said that they had no choice. The girl smiled and snapped her fingers. After this, Marbas immediately began to look pleasantly surprised. A green bottle of expensive champagne appeared. Marbas held champagne in his hands with a happy expression on his face and Lilith smiled sweetly. The girl held out a glass of Lucifer champagne. He began to refuse, saying that he would not drink with them. The girl replied that it is the work of demons to tempt people, but in the end the choice is made by Lucifer himself. He looked irritably at the sparkling drink and rudely ordered him to shut up, because he would never agree with demons in his life. Within a minute he emptied his glass. Lucifer's face looked very red and drunk. He said that it was not he who sinned but the one who prepared such a delicious drink. Lilith told him that it was not his fault. The clink of champagne glasses sounded. Marbas lit a cigarette and told his brother that he had always misunderstood him because he somehow thought that he would kill him for the slightest mistake. Phaetonatia picked up the ashtray and replied that he would not do anything like that to a member of his family. Marbas asked him what happened last time with that guy who showed off in front of everyone and Satanasia taught him a lesson. The older brother placed a clean ashtray on top of the dirty one. Satanasia, changing the ashtrays, answered him that he dared to attack his family, so he got what he deserved. The smoking Marbas made a surprised sound. He noticed that his brother was changing ashtrays, after which he grabbed all the ashtrays and awkwardly asked not to bother himself because he could change the ashtray himself. Satanasia calmly looked at him and replied that he understood. After that, he used a tentacle to pick up a bottle of champagne and handed the lighter to his brother. Marbas embarrassedly asked to stop this. Their private jet was flying high in the blue sky. Lilith looked at Lucifer slyly and said that since he fell from heaven, something fun happens every day. She asked if he could at least relax now before they got to the pickup point. The angel was drinking another glass of champagne. He replied that it sounded good, but he had no desire to rest in a lair filled with demons. Marbas approached him from behind and tried to calm him down, saying that no one would eat him here. He ran his thumb over Lucifer's lips. After that, he patted the angel on the head, holding a blue bottle of champagne in his hands, and said that you can always have fun. Lucifer looked at him annoyed and said that this is the whole point of demons. He sarcastically asked if he tempts people in the same way to eat them. Lilith stroked the angel's thigh with her hand and said that each demon treats people differently. Some people make friends with them, while others have love affairs. The girl took a sip of champagne and said that most demons like her prefer to enjoy people carefully and slowly and the smarter the demon, the easier it is for him to get along with people. Lucifer recalled an incident where a demon used him as bait and asked if such demons were in the minority. Satanasia asked if he was talking about Bagius, after which he said that sometimes there are such demons who seriously want to taste human flesh, but people are not stupid either. Lilith looked playfully and slyly at Satanasia and said that it also happened that people hunted for a demon. She added that in their time, the demons who continue to devour people are inferior beings and complete fools. Satanasia looked at her blankly. He turned his head and asked why she was looking at him like that. Lilith replied that she was talking about him. Lucifer jumped up from the sofa and pointed at the children sitting nearby. He shouted that they knew about Satanasia's plans and he saved these children as they were being taken to his citadel. Satanasia calmly looked at the children and said that he did not give the order to kidnap human children. Marbas covered his mouth with his hand in shock. He wondered who was driving the truck in which the children were being transported. If it was one of his brother's subordinates, he would definitely recognize him. Satanasia crossed his legs and said that children are useless even as labor, and if he ate people, then what is the point of kidnapping small children with whom you can't even get enough? His younger brother looked away shyly. Lilith put her hand on her cheek and said that she thought he was a pervert who loved children. Satanasia objected, looked at her arrogantly, and asked if she wanted to find a friend with similar interests, since she herself plays dress-up with the found angel. A tense silence fell between them. 
Lucifer turned to the children and asked what their names were. The girl, slightly embarrassed, said that her name was Eve. The boy replied that his name was Adam. Lucifer smiled and said that their names were like the first people on the planet and added that these were good names. Lilith crossed her arms and asked if they were related. Eve replied that she didn't remember this, so she didn't know. Lucifer looked at them knowingly and promised to look after them until they remembered something about themselves. Marbas intruded into the conversation. He wanted to talk about them. Suddenly someone started aiming at their plane. The siren began to sound loudly throughout the cabin. Annoyed, Lucifer asked what the noise was. Lilith turned around in alarm, realizing that this was an alarm. Thomas used speakerphone to tell her that something was wrong. She looked towards the speakers. Thomas tensed up and said into the radio that someone had just pointed a missile launcher at the plane. The girl asked in fear what was happening. Marbas began to panic, he hoped that this was just a joke. Satanasia remained calm and drank alcohol. Lucifer made a blank face. He didn't know what a rocket was. Marbas shouted that he again did not know such a word. Satanasia began to calmly explain what it was, telling the story of the appearance of rockets. His story puzzled the guy even more. Marbas shouted to his brother that there was no point in giving a whole lecture. The main character said that he did not understand anything, after which he climbed into the portal. Satanasia continued to drink champagne and invited him to look at the rocket so that he could understand everything himself. Alarmed, Marbas grabbed the radio and told him to release false flares to make the missiles explode. The angel came out of the portal and jumped onto the roof of the plane. Behind him, rockets were fired towards them. One of the missiles exploded in the air before reaching the plane. Lucifer turned around at the last flying rocket. He realized that the missiles were flying straight to the target and then exploding. He tore his legs away from the flying ship. The main character got closer to the rocket, which was now flying straight at him. He grinned, hanging upside down in the air. The angel opened a portal into which a rocket flew. The second portal was aimed at a wasteland on the ground from where the rocket flew out, exploding in the mountains. Not far from the flight site, there was a military camp with tanks and barracks. The military reported to the commander-in-chief that all the missiles were destroyed and the target could not be hit. The commander-in-chief ordered the attack to continue, to which her subordinates responded positively. A girl named Baphomet appeared to her. She had long black and yellow hair tied in two high ponytails. She was wearing a military jacket tied around her stomach, wide pants, and wore dog tags around her neck. Baphomet said that this airspace belongs to Asteroth, and uninvited guests are not welcome here. She ordered that no prisoners be taken. The plane began to fly lower and began to approach the horizon. Baphomet said that the invasion of Asteroth's airspace is unforgivable and no one should be left alive. She looked at the sky with her yellow eyes. Baphomet looked confident. Her subordinate in military uniform looked through binoculars and told the girl that there was some kind of shadow in the sky and perhaps it was a demon. This made Baphomet taken aback. She saw Lucifer and his red translucent wings in the sky. The girl tensed and raised her hand. She ordered the shelling to stop and to capture him alive. They said they had just launched the rocket. The main character, flying in the sky, saw a bright flash of light behind him. Marbus held the radio in his hands and said that everything was fine and they would land soon. The angel began to call out to him. He climbed out of the open portal on the ceiling of the plane. Marbus turned to him irritably and said that he was busy now. Lucifer made a blank face, hanging upside down, and asked if there were horses the size of airplanes in the human world. Marbus began to brush him off, saying that now was not the time for this. The main character said that this was not the point because there was a huge barricade against the cavalry in the mountains. He pictured it in his head as a child's drawing of a barricade and a sad horse. As soon as Marbus heard this, he made an awkward expression and realized what he was talking about. These were anti-aircraft guns aimed directly at their plane. Lilith got scared and grabbed the children, saying that there were no anti-aircraft guns before. 
Marbas asked Thomas if they still had flares. Thomas shouted to him over the radio that this was not a military aircraft and they did not have flares. Marbas asked him to start descending and turn around if they hit the radar. At this time, the auto guidance system determined that the aircraft was within their range. The missiles hit the plane's wing and body. Satanasia took two katanas in one hand. The falling plane headed down, burning up in the air. Passengers and pilots fell to the ground through portals, escaping the crash. Satanasia sheathed the katanas on his hips and said that they were all too noisy. Lilith was lying on Marbas. The girl said that Satanasia could have warned them before teleporting them. Confused Marbas agreed with her. They were ordered not to move. Lucifer turned towards the screams. The armed fighters pointed their weapons at them and said that they were ordered to detain them and shouted to the heroes to be quiet. The main character looked at the military with disappointment and said that this was a disturbing welcome. Lilith said that Asteroth should be at this base, but something went wrong. They pointed the barrel of a tank at them and ordered them to shut up. They threatened that if they approached them, fire would be opened on them. Lucifer asked what it was. Satanasia again began to explain to him abstrusely. He was interrupted by his younger brother, who said that there was a tank in front of them. In the main character's head, tanks are chariots with two horses, so he said that these tanks are different from the ones he knows. A military man wearing a helmet and vest shouted that they were able to destroy the auto-guided missiles, so he ordered to open fire on them. The military began shooting at them, firing a lot of bullets. A group of men did not stop the onslaught, shooting at the heroes. The shell casings fell to the ground with a ringing sound. They stopped the shooting, there was smoke from the weapons everywhere. The military man gritted his teeth and was taken aback, looking straight ahead. The main character had a red shield around him to protect him. He also caught several bullets with his hands and mouth. Holding the bullet, which was still smoking, between his teeth, Lucifer grinned and asked if they were done. The military man ordered the others not to panic, ordering his colleague to open fire and attack again. The soldier who was sitting in the tank accepted his order. A couple of seconds later, a powerful projectile came out of the tank's muzzle. Suddenly a hand grabbed the shell. The main character took a huge tank shell with his hands, stopping it. The military man was taken aback, unable to believe what had happened. Lucifer grinned, holding the projectile in his right hand, saying that was close. He put the shell behind his back and jumped up, ending up above the military man. The main character landed on the barrel of a tank. He looked down at the soldier and asked what would happen next. This question made the military man confused. Lucifer squatted down and asked what else they would do to entertain him. An order was received for all people to retreat. Baphomet came closer to the main character. Lucifer grinned at the girl and asked if she was Astareth. The girl replied that her name was Baphomet. She extended her hand to him, calling him the Angel of the Dawn Lucifer, and asked if he would agree to quietly follow her. The military quickly left the battlefield. Lucifer stood on the dais and looked at the girl below. Baphomet frowned and said that they were acting in Lady Asteroth's best interests, so she ordered him to follow them without causing trouble. The main character looked at her impudently, continuing to hold the projectile, and replied that he had a personal matter with Asteroth. Baphomet started to get irritated. She bared her teeth and said that he would not receive a personal audience with Asteroth simply because he was an angel. Lucifer answered her that he had not met such a stubborn demon for a long time. He looked at his allies and told them that they were still tolerant. Lilith looked at him and said in a mocking tone that they should be brothers in mind. Satanasia sat at the table and took out a cup of sugar from the portal. Eve and Adam were also sitting at the table next to him. The demon said that he doesn't care about Lilith, but don't dare compare him or Marbas to such a reckless demon. Lilith asked if he came up with the answer over a cup of tea. Lucifer said that he had chosen a bad time for tea. Baphomet said it was some kind of confusion. She put her hands in front of her and bent them at the elbows, saying that if he doesn't want it in a good way, then he will do it in a bad way. 
the main character threw the shell over his shoulders and answered her that now she speaks an understandable language. The girl pierced her skin with a sharp nail. From their blood began to flow, which began to transform into a sentient substance. The blood took the form of bullets. She raised her hand, ready to give the order to attack. Baphomet's gaze became wild. She said they were bloody bullets. The bullets, one by one, rushed towards the main character. Suddenly something made the girl taken aback and tense. The guy grinned, swinging the projectile. A red aura appeared around him, and he shouted that he was returning everything to her. The main character threw a shell right at the girl. It flew past her bloody bullets. There was a sound of an explosion and thick smoke appeared. Lucifer jumped down from the barrel of the tank. He looked irritably at his holy red wings. The guy stood opposite Baphomet, whose silhouette was hidden behind a curtain of smoke. She said they were not human toys. Blood began to pool around her hands, and the girl said that she was Asteroth's strongest servant. Her hands turned into bloody machine guns, and she said that Lucifer was nothing more than meat to be butchered. She pointed her weapon directly at the main character. This made him take a back and move. The machine guns began to spin, firing a strong barrage of bullets. The muzzles of the firearm became very hot and slightly yellowed, and there was smoke coming out of them. The bloody machine guns began to disappear. Baphomet grinned and called the guy a non-entity. Suddenly, she saw Lucifer rush into the sky, leaving a red light behind him. The main character opened his snow-white wings in the sky and said that her words were empty chatter. He used Johann's weapon Agdos. Many red arrows in the form of crosses appeared next to him. Baphomet's hands were cut up. She prepared a new batch of bloody bullets, looking at her opponent with contempt. The bullets were aimed towards the main character. Arrows and bullets crossed in the air, creating small pink explosions as they collided. The bullets flew into the sky one after another. Bloody trails surrounded the girl. Suddenly, she suddenly felt ill and began to feel dizzy. She used too much blood. Lucifer approached her. Feathers from his wings were flying everywhere. He swung his angelic red sword. Baphomet was helpless. She understood that she could no longer participate in the battle, so she mentally apologized to Lady Astaroth. The sword was supposed to plunge into her throat, but Lucifer pointed it past her head, tearing the collar of her jacket. He stood over her, spreading his angelic wings. The girl called him a fearless angel. Lucifer made a disdainful face. Baphomet turned her head away from the protagonist's eyes and acknowledged his strength, saying that he could kill her if he wanted. The guy's angel wings began to disappear. The girl's eyes began to close. She had one request that she was going to address to Lucifer. The excited Lilith and Marbas watched all this from the sidelines. Baphomet asked the protagonist to save Lady Astaroth. This puzzled him. The girl grabbed the blade of the sword, which immediately began to hurt her hand. She said that she was not forgiven for asking the angel for help, but she was obliged to save her master. Baphomet said that if he refused her request, she would die, but would sink her teeth into his throat until he agreed. The guy's gaze became empty and he lowered his head down. The main character remembered the battle in Satanasia's lair. Barbados then grabbed the defeated hero Pruflas with his hand and then grabbed Aemon by the scruff of the neck. He jumped high above Lucifer. Barbados looked at him angrily and said that one day he would cut off his hand just like he did to his master Satanasia. The bandaged Satanasia then ordered him not to talk nonsense and calm down. Then, Lucifer remembered Michael telling him that even demons form bonds. Then he pierced Lucifer through with his sword, asking what kind of bonds were between them. The main character was deeply immersed in memories, so his allies began calling him by name to bring him to his senses. As soon as he heard his name, he raised his head sharply and clenched his teeth. He looked at Baphomet, after which he removed his sword, stuck near the girl's head. The red sword disappeared and Lucifer looked the other way. He said that he would not do this and was not going to attack an unarmed and helpless fighter. The main character moved to the other side. Lilith sat down with Baphomet and asked if she could listen to what they had to say. 
Marbus said that they have a conversation with Astera. Baphomet stood up and with a surprised face asked if this angel and Lilith had the same goals. Lilith replied that it was true. She pointed at Lucifer and said that if they took him everywhere with them, they would be able to track Satan. Marbus lit a cigarette and asked how she could talk about such things if she was here for fun. Lilith asked if he really thought so. Lucifer said that he is so sweet that he can understand her desire to take care of him. Baphomet lowered her gaze in confusion. She couldn't believe that angels and demons were working together. She thought that the angel had forced them to go with him. Satanasia was still drinking tea at the table when they talked about this. He said he wasn't going to ignore it. Satanasia walked up to Baphomet, who was lying on the ground, and stated that he was only going to say this once, so she needed to listen carefully. An eerie purple aura appeared around him, and he looked at Baphomet with a frightening gaze. He firmly said that it was the angel who followed them, and not they who followed him. He smiled, looking condescendingly at the girl, and asked if she understood everything now. Baphomet was shaking with fear and even began to cry. She answered him in the affirmative, thinking that the admiral was very scary. Satanasia's words made Lucifer very angry. The main character was about to fight him, asking who said he was following them. Marbus tried to hold him back, saying that he needed to calm down and let Satanasia agree on everything, since it wouldn't take much time. Lilith looked at them with a grin. Satanasia ordered Baphomet to reforge his swords while they went about their business. The frightened girl agreed. Lucifer looked at the bullet with pleasure. He twirled the bullet in his hands, telling Lilith that this was the first time he had received anything from people. She smiled awkwardly and crossed her arms over her chest, answering that it was not a gift at all. The heroes and Baphomet approached the underground entrance to the military base. Baphomet said that she would have to go underground, it was easier to show them everything than to try to explain. Lucifer walked up to the entrance and put his hands in his pockets, saying that they needed to go underground. They all walked along a corridor illuminated by blue light. Lilith turned around, looking at the children. Satanasia said he expected to see a damp chamber underground, but he was wrong. Marbas became embarrassed and turned to his brother. He asked if they had bought a military helicopter. Lilith put her hands behind her back and said that Astaroth has become richer and more powerful since they last saw each other, since he has an army of people and a lot of equipment. The protagonist mentally imagined exchanging money for a fictitious airplane, asking whether people exchange labor, food and money for economic activity. Lilith answered him in the affirmative, saying that in the human world you need to have money in order to do anything. She said that when she arrived in the human world, she immediately found a patron. Marbas was engaged in exchange on the foreign exchange market with the help of Demonic Eye. He was then sitting in front of the computer, pressing something on the keyboard. Lilith called him greedy, to which Marbas told her that most of Satanasia's purchases were made using his wallet. Satanasia also said that many low-ranking demons who came to the human world were killed by humans, and if they did not protect and train them, their numbers would rapidly decline. He remembered how Ammon, Barbados and Pruflas were cornered while people aimed rifles at them. Satanasia closed his eyelids and calmly looked straight, saying that he did not want to reduce the number of his highness's fighters, meaning Satan, even if they were low-ranking. He believed that Asteroth was of the same opinion. Baphomet walked up to the iron screen and began typing in the code. She said that when the angels disappeared, the demons, who could not satisfy their desires, came to the human world. When demons arrived in the human world, they tried to control people, but there were too many people. Their powers were limited to America, parts of Europe, and a small number of other countries. The iron door began to slowly rise up. Baphomet said the U.S. government initially placed them in a quarantine zone, calling them aliens. Everyone entered the dark room. The only light coming from there was from the corridor. Baphomet said that humans had advanced so far in developing weapons that even demons could no longer control it, and Lady Astaroth liked humans' technology so much that he made a deal with the government. Lucifer looked around, putting his hands in his pockets. 
he was surprised that people made a deal with the demon. Satanasia walked next to him. He said that they, demons, cannot break a promise once made, but people are not capable of this. Lilith walked behind Satanasia. She put her hands behind her back and said that the effect of Lord Satan's disappearance was so great that they had to take a risk. Satanasia turned to her and said that all they were doing was trying to find different ways to raise the weak to their feet, unlike her, who alone fled to nowhere. Lilith told him that he talks too much. The main character said that some people in this company enjoy freedom most of all. Satanasia looked away and told Lilith that even the angel agreed with him. Lucifer frowned and pointed his finger at Satanasia, saying that he was talking about him, not Lilith. He asked is he really doing it and said that he's a natural. Marbas looked at him with a smile mentally praising the angel. Suddenly something caught Lucifer's attention. He looked at the destroyed containers on which there were traces of blood and glowing liquid. The main character asked what it was. He turned his gaze to Baphomet standing nearby and asked who Asteroth was fighting. Baphomet's gaze was downcast. She said that this happened a few days ago. Asteroth was wearing a long black cloak with high boots. She had long black hair with red streaks and had two red horns on her head. She stood opposite a stranger with long blonde hair in a hood. The stranger looked like an angel. He lowered his head, hiding his face behind his hood. Asteroth looked straight at him, her mouth slightly open. The space behind the demon began to tear apart and darkness began to appear. From the darkness appeared many golden mechanical hands, behind which a face appeared with closed eyes. Hands reached out to Asteroth, which made her confused. The hands grabbed him and pressed him directly to the container, not allowing the demon to move. Asteroth's horns were broken. She raised her hand, bloody patterns appeared around it. The attacker tensed, clenching his hands into fists. A ribbon of bloody patterns grabbed him, wrapping around the stranger's body. At this time, Baphomet ran into the room. She looked scared and shocked. The girl frowned, trying to understand what was happening. Beads of sweat rolled down her face. She silently watched as Asteroth was unconscious in huge arms. There was blood coming from her mouth and body. Baphomet ran towards her master, extending her hand to him and calling his name. However, she did not have time, and the hand began to drag Asteroth into the darkness. After hearing what she said, Marbas lowered his gaze and clenched his teeth. He couldn't believe that this happened to Asteroth, the Grand Duchess, who was also known as the ruler of the earth. Lucifer looked to the side with a calm gaze. He said that even in paradise he heard stories about him, that he was second in power after Satan. Baphomet removed the tarp from the angel encased in a crystalline capsule. He was unconscious. The girl said that it was the angel who did this to Asteroth and asked if they were looking for him. The main character looked up in surprise. He recognized this angel as Uriel. Lucifer smiled and said that it's real this time and then began to wake him up. Baphomet replied that he would not wake up. She pointed to Uriel and the red patterns around him. These were the sealing letters of Lady Astereth. The girl said that if he were dead, the writing would collapse on its own. Lucifer said they are still there. Baphomet frowned and firmly said that Asteroth was still alive somewhere. Marbas approached her and asked if she had any idea where Asteroth was imprisoned. The girl looked at her reflection in the crystal and replied that she did not know. She said that to her that thing looked like a shining angel. Baphomet lowered her head sullenly and said that for this reason she thought that if she captured the angel, she would be able to find out something. Lucifer looked at her suspiciously. Marbus tapped the crystal capsule and said that since Uriel was in this state, they couldn't do anything. The main character looked at him and ordered him to stop because Uriel was his friend. Marbus wanted to tell him that the capsule was not that fragile. Suddenly, the space near the ceiling seemed to break and Asteroth flew out from there with pistols in his hands. Lucifer, Baphomet and Marbus were shocked. Asteroth clenched his teeth twirling the pistols with his fingers. Her horns were still broken. Marbas raised his head in surprise, looking at the falling demon, and said that it was unexpected. Satanasia frowned, pursing his lips. 
his pupils constricted. The main character looked confused. His mouth was slightly open, revealing snow-white teeth. Suddenly Satanasia suddenly grabbed his brother by the collar of his shirt and jacket. A huge golden hand hit the floor. Lucifer and Baphomet managed to jump away. Satanasia threw his brother aside to save him. Marbus looked back in fear and confusion, asking about Uriel. Uriel, still imprisoned in the crystal, fell out of the red portal onto the floor, head down. Lucifer slid across the floor, saying he barely made it in time. Marbus said that his friend just went hard and it'll crack. The entire room was bathed in red light. Satanasia put his hand on the hilt of the sword and said that now is not the time to joke. He ordered the creature to come outside. At this time, the frightened Marbas stood behind him. A huge hand grabbed the edge of the broken wall. A huge creature with many arms began to emerge from the darkness. It looked like a centipede. On its head was a golden mask with closed eyes. Lucifer tensed and took a step back. Baphomet began to panic as she looked at the approaching monster. Asteroth stood on one of the metal containers, holding pistols in his hands. Baphomet looked at her with loving eyes and shouted his name. The main character looked at her in bewilderment. The girl sighed anxiously, looking at her master. Asteroth had a deep wound on her face that was bleeding. The corner of her lips was also bloody. There were cuts on his body, blood from which dripped onto his black clothes. Baphomet began to speak in a trembling voice about the fact that Lady Asteroth's beautiful body was injured. She bit her lip until it bled, angry at the monster. The blood from her body began to turn into rocket launchers and large machine guns. She angrily shouted that she would kill him with all her body and soul, ordering him to get ready. Lucifer and Marbas trembled with fear, clinging to the tired Lilith. The shells flew out of the spinning machine gun with lightning speed. Baphomet was furious, she screamed as loud as she could. The tension even made a vein appear on her cheek. Shots from a machine gun hit the carcass of an unknown monster. Baphomet unleashed all the firepower she had. The missiles caused bright and loud explosions on the enemy's body. Lucifer looked at the battle blankly and wondered what was wrong with this demon. Lilith turned her head towards him and asked which one he was talking about. Asteroth ran up to them sharply and called the angel to him. The main character was slightly embarrassed. Asteroth frowned and pointed a pistol at Lucifer, ordering him to answer questions. The main character asked why she was screaming like that. The demoness asked if this monster was some kind of angel. This question angered the angel, and he answered irritably that he had never seen such angels. Astaroth continued to press him, asking if they were accomplices. The main character answered this question negatively. This was enough for Astaroth to be convinced that the angel and monster were not allies. She prepared her pistols and ordered Lucifer to assist in killing the monster, which caused confusion among the angel. There was a light column of smoke around Baphomet. Her weapon gone, she cursed in irritation. She stood on a hill and looked at the monster, who did not even look wounded. She spent all her resources on the attack. The girl looked closely at the monster's mask, realizing that there was not a single scratch on it. Asteroth tossed her one of his pistols, ordering her to use it. Baphomet deftly caught the gun with one hand. Suddenly, she lovingly began to kiss the weapon given to her by her master. She thanked Asteroth, who jumped onto the high ground with her. Baphomet assumed a shooting pose. Perplexed, Lucifer asked what it was just now. The main character got closer to the monster and prepared his red sword. He said he couldn't keep up with the demons, but not like that's the point. With an excited smile, he jumped up, preparing to attack. But suddenly his sword broke as soon as he hit one of the monster's paws. Lucifer looked in bewilderment at the flying pieces of the sword, not understanding why this happened. The monster tried to attack him with one of its hands, but the main character reacted in time and jumped away. He landed next to Satanasia and annoyedly told him that this monster is made of adamantine. Satanasia prepared to draw one of his katanas and replied that his sword did not have as much power as Lucifer thought. The main character lowered his head, narrowing his eyes. 
He said that their weapons were made of holy light and any demon would get hurt just by touching it. The angel looked at his broken sword, of which only the handle and a small part of the blade remained. He remembered when Baphomet attacked, she touched the blade of his sword and her hand immediately began to bleed and burn. Lucifer said that there was no way that a demon could not take damage from such a weapon. He looked at the monster that was climbing onto the containers, thinking that this monster was not a demon or an angel. The eyes on the monster's mask opened, but in place of the eyes there were two mouths with sharp fangs. Lucifer knelt down on one knee, and the sight he saw made him feel disgusted. A dark, purple liquid began to flow abundantly from these monster mouths. From the formed puddle, the head of another creature appeared, looking like a mannequin. Gradually, the creature began to emerge completely from the liquid. He had four arms. Once it was on its feet, it leaned back, shaking off all the excess liquid. The creature raised its hands, in which a circle of light began to appear. Five circles of light appeared around it. Gradually, similar creatures began to appear from the dark liquid, but with two arms. Lucifer tensed, looking at the approaching army. He said their numbers are increasing. Satanasia replied that this is quite problematic. Strange creatures immediately ran towards them, preparing to attack them. Lucifer readied his weapon, glaring at his enemies. Satanasia remained calm as he began to unsheath his katana. They united to fight against the creatures. In one move, they cut off the legs and arms of some of the creatures. One of the enemies was about to attack Lucifer from behind. He reacted in time and, leaning on his scythe, jumped forward, kicking the creature's legs. Suddenly, the main character noticed that the monsters rushed in the other direction, ignoring him. He looked in which direction they were running and was horrified. There stood the children Adam and Eve, who were about to be attacked by monsters. Lucifer ordered them to flee. The children looked scared and confused. They didn't know what to do. The sounds of blows were heard and drops of blood appeared. Lucifer was surprised. He looked at what was happening with his mouth open. The children looked in fear as one of the mannequins was entwined with a snake's tail. It was Lilith. Her skin was partially covered with scales. She put her hand on her cheek and said that she did not like this look because she was ugly in it. Marbas smiled at her and told her not to worry because she is always beautiful. Purple crystals appeared around his eyes. Lilith used her transformation skill and her lower body became like a snake. She held one of the creatures with her tail. Marbas also used his transformation skill and his arms and legs turned into white lion paws. Lilith's large tail wrapped around two mannequins. She squeezed them and pulled them towards her, not allowing them to move. She smiled slyly, narrowing her eyes, and said a sweet goodbye to her enemies. Squeezing her tail tighter, she broke the mannequins into small pieces. Marbus was squatting. He heard one of the mannequins approaching him from behind. He deftly jumped, standing on one paw, and tore off his enemy's head with a blow. Lilith looked at Adam and Eve and asked them to hide somewhere. The girl straightened her hair and smiled. She said that she will clear up after Lucifer so he can do his best. Marbas squatted down and said that they weren't that good at fighting, so he asked his older brother to try harder. Lucifer turned to them and gave them a thumbs up, saying that everything would be done. Satanasia was flattered by their words, but tried not to show it. One of the mannequins ran towards Satanasia from the left side from the back. He noticed this and turned around. The demon slid a little to the side. With one blow of his sword, he cut the dummy in half. He plunged his katana into the chest of one of the mannequins as he watched the rest of the enemies surround him. He noticed that these things keep coming from his left. Suddenly Satanasia suddenly felt how it became harder for him to pull out his sword. He turned around and saw that the mannequin, into whose chest he had stuck the katana, grabbed the blade and did not let go. He immediately calmed down, noting that it was a smart move. Two enemies were approaching him from behind. He pierced them with his sharp purple tentacles. Three mannequins were pierced with spiked tentacles. Satanasia looked at his missing arm and said that he needed to get used to the fact that he only had one arm. 
Lucifer swung his bright red scythe with all his might. The flow of air made his hair and clothes flutter in the wind. With one blow from the tip of his scythe, he cut the mannequin's head in half. After that, he cut the creature's body so that it did not move. At this time, a second mannequin was approaching him. The main character deftly jumped, crushing the creature's head with his foot. He bent his knees slightly, holding his scythe with both hands. Lucifer grinned and said that although there are many of them, they are very weak. A sharp blade flashed near the angel's head, causing him to tense up. It was Satanasia, piercing the head of another mannequin. Lucifer looked at this slightly annoyed. Satanasia, with a katana in his hand, looked at the angel and told him not to let his guard down. With one movement of his hand, he cut the creature in half. Satanasia and Lucifer stood opposite each other, looking into each other's eyes. The main character asked what it was. Lucifer frowned, staring at Satanasia with his red eye. The demon remained calm and, narrowing his eyes, looked back at the angel. The next second, they were again fighting side by side with the dummies, masterfully wielding their weapons. Their backs collided, and Satanasia said displeasedly that he didn't like being in sync with him. Satanasia replied that he just needed to get used to it. Lucifer looked at the approaching army of mannequins and said that their numbers were not decreasing. He cursed with his back to Satanasia and asked what was going on. Satanasia grinned and wanted to ask if he was already exhausted, but suddenly someone grabbed him by the sleeve of his shirt. The stranger pulled the demon towards him, causing him to be surprised and confused. Satanasia raised his katana, preparing to defend himself however, he saw Marbus. His brother looked different than usual. He had his hair down and an all-white suit. Satanasia's pupils shrank and his face became covered in sweat. He called Marbus by name in confusion. Behind Marbus with his hair down, the real Marbus responded to his name in his usual appearance, with a ponytail on his head and in a gray shirt with black pants. This shocked Satanasia. At this time, it was not the real Marbus who grabbed him by the throat. He knocked Satanasia to the floor, holding his arm with his other hand. His katana was out of the way, and he couldn't move. The real Marbus panicked, calling out his brother's name. While the imposter was strangling Satanasia, the demon asked how a fake appeared here. The mannequin itself was not the real Marbus. He was kneed in the head by Lucifer. He threw the imposter aside from Satanasia, saving him. Lucifer asked him in surprise what happened to him. Satanasia, sitting on the floor, rubbed his throat and asked if the main character had seen this. Lucifer didn't understand what he was talking about. He made a questioning face and said that he didn't know what Satanasia meant. The demon looked at him in confusion, frowning. He looked at Marbas, wondering if he was the only one who saw this. To him, the mannequin looked like his little brother. For the rest, it was just an ordinary mannequin, of which there are many. Memories of how he spoke with his brother arose in Satanasia's head. The main character looked away, making a serious face, and said that they should not let their guard down, even if they were small fry. Suddenly, a girl in a blue dress with blonde hair appeared in front of him. She wrapped her arms around the angel's neck. Lucifer recognized her as his friend Misha. He remembered swimming in the pond. Behind his back were huge, red wings like those of a dragon. Misha then told him that the others said that his wings looked like demonic ones and promised misfortune. She smiled sweetly at him, putting her hand under his head, and said that she liked his wings because it's the color of seeing blood and life. These words then impressed the guy. Drops of water dripped from his innocent face. Suddenly, he saw Misha's body being pierced by Satanasia's tentacle. This made the main character sigh and tense, his mouth parted. Satanasia looked in his direction and raised his hand. He said to take a closer look because this is an imposter and this caught him off guard earlier. Lucifer tensed in annoyance and looked away, saying that it annoyed him. He frowned and tensed because each of his angel friends is important to him. Lilith and Marbas were surrounded by many mannequins. The demons were breathing heavily from fatigue. Lilith's face turned slightly red and she looked exhausted. The girl said that the mannequins do not end. Marbas clenched his teeth, breathing heavily. 
he said that his physical strength see away at a faster rate in the morning. The main character punched another creature and called out to Marbas, asking if he had any ideas. The demon was silent for a while, looking at his surroundings. Then he said that it's probably because of that first spawn right here. He pointed to the main mannequin with four arms and five circles of light around it. Marbas suggested that destroying it might stop the multiplication. Lilith wrapped her tail around one of the mannequins and said that since Lucifer could fly, he could take it down from the air. Lucifer agreed with her and flew into the air, stepping on the faces of the mannequins. He almost approached the main mannequin, examining it from the air. The main character prepared his scythe and was about to attack, smiling with excitement. Suddenly a huge, heavy hand hit him on the head, knocking him down. The angel fell with his back on the container, bending it. This heavy hand belonged to a monster. Out of the smoke and darkness, the monster began to approach Lucifer. The main character fell down to the floor. He rubbed the back of his head, irritably saying that it's annoying. He squinted and began to carefully examine what was in front of him. Lucifer noticed the light that surrounded the main mannequin. He raised his head and called out to Asteroth, who was on a hill fighting the monster. He ordered him to remove the seal from Uriel. Asteroth asked him again, to which Lucifer ordered him to just do it. Osteroth raised his index finger, around which a red magical script appeared. He said that if Lucifer decided to deceive him, then she would kill him. The red seal began to disappear from Uriel's body under the crystal. The crystal shell was broken and stone particles scattered everywhere. Uriel was released. He sat on the floor, awakened. He didn't understand anything. Furiel looked down with his white eyes. Particles of crystal dust flew around him. He tried to understand where he ended up. Lucifer ran up to the unaware angel and greeted him. The main character apologized for waking him up, saying that he needed his help. Uriel didn't seem to hear him. He turned his head the other way without answering. Lucifer called out to him again. He called his name even louder, but Uriel suddenly turned his head towards him and greeted him. The main character tried to tell him what was wrong, but Uriel interrupted him, asking what was going on. Lucifer was confused, looking at his friend. He realized that they're not on the same page. Uriel asked if it was too cold today. Suddenly, he and Lilith turned around in surprise. Lucifer and Marbas looked confused and in shock. Asteroth, Baphomet and Satanasia calmly watched what was happening. Eve said that she was going to wait until more angels gathered. She put her hand on her hip and added that they didn't have much time. The main character came closer to her and asked again in confusion. Eve replied that everything was exactly as she said. The girl said that her name was Eve, and then she pointed to the boy and said that his name was Adam. She said that they were originally people created by God. One of Lucifer's eyebrows lowered when the girl said that angels are heavenly messengers of harmony and stagnation. Then Eve turned her gaze to Satanasia and said that demons are the embodiment of greed, creating chaos. The girl extended her hand to them and asked for their help. Tired Satanasia bent down slightly. Broken mannequins lay around him. He asked the angels if they knew about a one-liner for someone who advises them to choose the right place, time, and occasion. Lucifer told him that he would remember this, and the next time he sees a guy drinking tea in unusual places, he will definitely tell him about it. The main character and Satanasia argued for some time, grinning at each other. Uriel saw only their silhouettes and the warm light inside them. He closed his eyes looking down, saying that this is how it felt. He looked at the mannequins that were approaching him. But he saw only dark silhouettes and a red light inside them. He told Lucifer that everything was fine. The main character turned to him with a calm face. Uriel raised his hands and said that he had everything under control. He clenched his hands into fists, turning them towards him. Suddenly, the light in the mannequin's hands began to disappear. One circle of light after another began to go out, which caused bewilderment in the creature. Some mannequins kept appearing from the shadows. Suddenly, they began to disappear until they disappeared completely. Surprised, Marbas looked at this and said that multiplication had stopped. 
Lilith also turned to the mannequins and said that they were born from the shadow, and the shadow cannot exist without light. Uriel smiled faintly and said that he had done his part well. Lucifer flew past him on his red wings. In front of him stood an army of mannequins and the main four-armed mannequin. A red angelic sword began to appear in the hands of the main character. Uriel turned around and with a smile on his face said that Command Seraphim Lucifer would leave the rest to him. With one movement, the dream four-armed mannequin was cut in half. Excitement was visible on the protagonist's face as he fought the enemy. Without turning around, he thanked Uriel for his help while he stood with his back to him. While Lucifer was busy killing enemies, Uriel yawned tiredly. A grin appeared on the protagonist's face. He looked focused. He kicked the dummy on the head and shouted that this was the last one. The huge monster watched as his army fell and could no longer fight. A black gap into darkness opened again in space. The monster began to walk into the darkness, opening its giant mouth. After some time, the monster completely disappeared into the darkness. Lucifer angrily shouted at the monster not to run away. He was very angry. Satanasia told him to stop. He frowned slightly and looked away, saying that none of them could harm this creature, whatever it was. The main character gritted his teeth and clenched his hands into fists, looking at the leaving monster. Tired Asteroth and Baphomet also looked at the strange creature. Suddenly the main character remembered about Adam and Eve. He turned around, asking where they were. The children stood near Marbus and Lilith, who were sitting on the floor and breathing heavily. Lilith threw her head back and closed her eyes, saying that she was tired. Marbus took out a cigarette and asked Asteroth if he could smoke here. Adam and Eve looked at them slightly confused and scared. Lucifer noticed the state of his allies. He opened his mouth slightly. After that, he put his hands in his pockets and, with a mocking tone, asked the demons if they really got tired so quickly. Lilith turned to him and replied that if he had not been so stupid, he would have noticed it earlier. Marbus held a lit cigarette in his hands and said that Lucifer and Satanasia fought really well against a lot of enemies. The main character sighed displeasedly, holding out his hand to them. The demons looked at him questioningly. Lucifer turned his head to the side, making a confused expression, and said that they really did give it all. These words touched Lilith, and she blushed slightly. Marbus felt uncomfortable with such praise. He grabbed Lucifer's outstretched hand and began to stand up. Asteroth jumped down and told Satanasia that they had not seen each other for a long time. Satanasia looked at him, calling the demon by name. Asteroth came closer to him and said that she had a rough idea of their goals. He narrowed his eyes slightly and looked at Lucifer. The main character at this time helped Lilith get up from the floor, holding her hand. Astaroth said that an angel reaching out to demons is strange. Suddenly Lucifer turned sharply and began to look more concentrated. He clenched his hands into fists and began to walk towards Astaroth, who crossed her arms over her chest. The main character said that he completely forgot about him. He put his hand on his shoulder as if preparing for a fight and said that he had come to beat him up and make him spit out what he knows. Despite this, Lucifer asked himself why he was doing this again. Lilith looked at him and said that this is not appropriate. Marbus held a cigarette in his mouth and wondered why he was still full of energy. Astheroth smiled widely and began to laugh. There were traces of blood on the corners of her lips. She grinned evilly and began to crack her fingers, calling the guy a nice bloodsucker. She said that he would tell everything without a fight, but if he wanted, they could beat each other until they were satisfied. Lucifer refused this. The main character pointed his finger at him and asked what he wanted by tying up Uriel. Uriel said that it was he who came to Astaroth to ask for a truce. This surprised Lucifer. He looked at him in bewilderment and asked if he really did it. Uriel looked at him and said that he's not fit for politics after all. He pointed at Asteroth, who crossed his arms over his chest, and said that both sides were in an anomalous situation where they both lost their fathers. Therefore, Uriel decided that Asteroth, who manages to negotiate with humans, could understand him. 
Bastareth said that in the middle of their conversation that monster appeared. He then tore open the space and entered the room. Astaroth said that it was possible that the dull-looking angel was setting something up, so he decided to use his own technique to restrain and keep him here. Then he bound the angel with his red seal. Astaroth went on to say that if the negotiations were sincere, Uriel would crystallize and protect himself from the monster before his technique completely sealed his powers. Uriel then actually encased himself in a crystal capsule, being bound by the seal. Astaroth grinned and crossed his arms, saying that her subordinates, fortunately, saw the whole ordeal. She praised Baphomet for helping him. Baphomet leaned against his feet and said that she was glad that her master was all right. The confused protagonist looked at the crawling girl and said that he really didn't want to ask, but he would do it anyway. He asked what she was doing. Baphomet got angry and clenched her hand into a fist. She asked if he was blind and said that she was looking for a place where Asteroth could step. Lucifer made a perplexed face and tried to ask why and why she was doing this. Marbus asked why he couldn't ask her this directly. Baphomet rudely ordered him to leave and said that he did not understand anything. She continued to crawl on the floor, saying that Asteroth is merciful and she would never trample a subordinate. Her face went crazy. Thwet was running down her face and drool was dripping from her mouth. She asked what if she accidentally ended up on the path Asteroth was taking. After this, Baphomet said that Asteroth might accidentally step on her and she would do everything for this. The main character said that they don't understand anything and called her a fool. Marbus asked Asteroth if she knew anything about this strange monster. She crossed her arms and replied that she didn't know that. Marbas rubbed the back of his head, saying that it was worth the wait. Lucifer looked straight ahead in confusion and said that after all the bloody work, they only found out about the special character of this demon. Eve said that this monster is a demigod. She turned to the demons and angels, extending her hand to them and asked them for help. All attention was focused on the children, Adam and Eve. The main character looked at the girl in confusion, asking what she meant. Eve put her hand on her chest and said that she was Eve from Eden and she came here as her father's messenger. Lilith looked at her slightly confused, narrowing her eyes and asked if she was the same Eve who was created from the ribs of Adam. Eve looked up at her and answered in the affirmative. She thanked Lilith for her hospitality. Lucifer pointed his finger at the girl and asked Lilith if they knew each other. The girl immediately began to deny, looking away to the side. Lucifer raised one eyebrow and said that he had seen Adam and Eve a long time ago. This was back in paradise, they then looked like grown men and women. The main character said that he doesn't think children are pretending to be them. Adults Adam and Eve stood near an apple tree, from the branches of which three red apples hung. Eve said that they've lived for 900 years ever since they were exiled from Eden. The girl raised her hand and said that they took this form right after they were able to return from heaven. Marbus turned to them and raised his hand. He said that he now realized that they were not just children. He suggested cutting the case here because he was afraid that their enemy might return. Eve looked at him and thoughtfully agreed with him. Eve excitedly put her fist to her chest and shouted that the whole world was under attack right now. Moreover, not only the world of people is under attack, but also the world of the gods. Eve revealed that the demigods, elder gods, and even the eternal outer gods began to invade this world at the same time for unknown reasons. Along with the monster that attacked the heroes, the world was attacked by various strange creatures that looked crazy. Eve said that her father did everything possible to stop their invasion. The gray-haired god then restrained the dark forces with the help of his staff. As a last resort, he entrusted Adam and Eve with holy water. Lucifer and the others looked at Eve in confusion. The main character said that he had never heard of holy water and asked what it was. Eve answered him that this is a hidden treasure that allows him to absorb and also reproduce any powers and make them his own. Lilith seemed to understand what Eva was talking about and immediately wanted to exclaim something. Marbas looked at her sternly, interrupting her. 
he said with just one look that there was no point in saying that. Lilith fell silent and looked at Marba's slightly embarrassed. Eve put on a serious face and said that when they got there, they were already in the midst of a decisive battle with Satan. She said that it was during that decisive battle that she and Adam tried to entrust the crystal to Lucifer. Adam and Eve, in the guise of children, were then not far from the battlefield. Adam held a yellow glowing crystal in his hands. A terrifying Satan appeared before them, with two bright flashes of red and blue light circling in the sky. Suddenly Adam and Eve looked horrified at what was happening. By this point, Lucifer had already been betrayed by Michael, who stabbed him with his great sword. Lucifer began to fall down, which Adam and Eve noticed. The girl threw the crystal into the air to save Lucifer. She said that she barely had the crystal implanted in him. The crystal hit the angel's chest, leaving a golden and glowing trail behind it. Eve put her hand on Adam's shoulder and said that at that time someone stole part of Adam's heart and soul and then pushed him to earth. She said that this is the truth of the battle they saw. The main character grabbed his chest. Eve said that it was he who now had holy water in his body, and now he must become strong enough to fight the external gods. To do this, he needed to fight on the same side with Adam and Eve, who could activate the crystal's evolutionary power. Eve looked at him pleadingly and for the sake of the well-being of the whole world asked him to help them. All eyes were on Lucifer. He was silent for a moment, his thumbs in his pockets. The main character closed his eyes and asked to give him some time, as he had questions. He spread his arms to the sides and asked what this unknown enemy was and where his fluffy wings had gone. He was told that's his second tier. He remembered how ancient celestial symbols appeared from his chest. He asked if the head in his head spoke to him in an ancient language because of this crystal. He said that voices have been bothering him lately, so he just ignores them. The main character also remembered how he first had snow-white wings. Satanasia pursed his lips and sarcastically asked if he was okay to hear voices in his head. Lucifer shouted to him that he's still sane, after which he said that every time he gets a new ability, he hears the names one by one and he thinks it's because of the crystal. Eve answered him that it seems like he can hear the oracle. The main character pointed at Uriel and said that he was a scout during that battle, after which he asked if he was sure that it was Michael who pierced him with the sword. Uriel lowered his gaze, taking an uncertain pose, and answered affirmatively. He said that the main character and Michael were talking about something in front of Satan, but then Michael did it. Uriel still couldn't believe that they were having such an argument. Lucifer frowned and narrowed his eyes. He finally got answers, but he wasn't happy about it. He asked if anyone had any idea where Michael had gone. Uriel narrowed his eyes slightly and raised the beginning of his eyebrows. He said he didn't know that. When he woke up, he was already on earth. Uriel said that there were no signs of angels or gods in heaven, and he still could not find any trace of Michael. Astaroth frowned and said that Mr. Satan had also not been found since then, and what's worse was that the anti-Satan faction was growing and moving forward, taking advantage of this chaos. Hearing the name of the faction, Satanasia frowned and called them Bunch. His brother Marbas looked at him and said that now was not the time for this. Eve turned to Admiral Satanasia and Duchess Astaroth. They frowned. Eve said that while they have not found Satan, she asks them on behalf of her father. She extended her hand to them and asked them to lend her their strength to fight the external enemy. Asteroth began to take out a scroll from her chest, saying that her father is their enemy and she would never think of joining forces, but at the moment they are running out of time, so a temporary conciliatory alliance is inevitable. Eve looked at her calmly and said that this was a wise choice. She said that the one they fought with earlier was just the first detachment among the army of people who became gods. They become stronger through faith and now their strength is immeasurable. They all remembered that monster, which in appearance resembled a scalopendra with a mask on its head. Marbas scratched his head thoughtfully and said that he couldn't even imagine that a whole bunch of gods would attack them. 
Lilith put her hand to her chin and said that besides this, there are other things happening here. Asteroth placed her hand on her chest and signed the contract with the help of a demonic hand that appeared above her head. She stated that it is in the name of Asteroth, the demon dragon and duchess of the demon world, that the forty demon followers of Satan swear that they will not touch the angels and will spare no effort to cooperate with them until Satan returns. The retinue curled up again, surrounded by a red glow. The contract hit Lucifer in the chest, and he said that they really like contracts. He turned to Satanasia and asked if he was signing the contract. Satanasia looked at Marbus and said that he had lost contact with his relatives, so he relied on Marbus. His younger brother held three smartphones in his hands and said that he was already doing this. Asteroth looked calm. She pressed her lips together. The main character closed his eyes and rubbed his neck, saying that he never thought that he would make a contract with a demon, after which he said that he was counting on Asteroth. Satanasia narrowed his eyes and gritted his teeth, telling the angel to do everything in his power for his highness. Lucifer asked if he had listened carefully. Uriel raised his finger and said that at the moment they need to protect Adam and Eve while they search for the rest of the angels and Satan. He said that he was from the Survey Corps himself, so it would be good for him to work with a demon who was good at gathering information. Satanasia looked towards his brother and said that he should take Proofless and came with him. Marbas replied that things were a little complicated between him and Kame, so he could only take Proofless. Asteroth looked to her left and said that their people would also conduct reconnaissance. Suddenly, there was an explosion and the wall behind them was broken. The main character turned around in confusion, looking at what was happening. Demons appeared from there with bags on their heads and in brown suits. They said that such nonsense would not be tolerated and they would all kneel before the new king of the demon world. The main character turned to Asteroth and said that they had just talked about a truce. Asteroth looked at the demons in shock and replied that they were part of the anti-Satan faction. She didn't know they could get in here. She ordered Baphomet to find and secure the exit. Baphomet accepted her order and ran to carry it out. One of the demon enemies was about to attack Asteroth. Lucifer managed to run in time and repulse the attack with his sword. He turned to Asteroth, standing near the defeated enemy, and said that he would buy them some time and ordered the rest to be taken out of here. Asteroth grabbed her stomach and chuckled. She walked in the other direction and raised her hand, saying that she was leaving this place to Lucifer. After that, she ordered the others to follow her. The main character threw his sword over his shoulder and said that he said this to look cool, but there were still too many enemies. He looked at the advancing hordes of the enemy and asked if Satan was that unpopular. Satanasia approached him. He turned to his enemies and called them infidels who were doing harm to his highness. Satanasia frowned, pursing his lips, and said that it was brave of them to come in groups, and threatened them that he would crush them all right now. Hearing this, Lucifer turned to him and grinned, saying that he would take his words back. Satanasia took out his katana and told Lucifer that he should be glad that he was working for his highness. The main character scratched his head and asked if Satanasia could learn to speak normally. The demon swung with all his might at the main character. Lucifer managed to jump away, so the blow hit the stone floor, which broke. A cut appeared on the demon's hand and began to bleed. Suddenly, the demon's entire hand was cut off, and he began to scream in horror in pain. While he was writhing in unbearable pain on the floor, the main character sighed tiredly, holding his sword in his hands. The horde of Satan's opponents was advancing directly towards Lucifer and Satanasia. They shouted that Satan's reign was over and their lord would start a revolution. The main character looked at this crowd and realized that there was no end to them, but they needed to gain more time. He called out to Satanasia and said that it was time for them to escape. The sharp tentacles of Satanasia's tentacles flew past him. The tentacles pierced the demon's bodies, tearing them apart. Satanasia firmly said that he would never serve anyone other than Satan. Above his head hung the corpse of a demon hanging by its tentacles. The lifeless bodies of his opponents also lay at his feet. 
Satanatia said that he would destroy them all and their master. He frowned and narrowed his eyes, saying that they shouldn't think that he would die so easily. Lucifer ran up to him and grabbed him by the stomach, shouting that they could not stay here any longer. The main character threw Satanatia over his shoulder and ran towards the exit. Satanatia begged to be released and let him kill everyone, to which Lucifer told him that everything was fine and they had already bought enough time. The main character narrowed his eyes and calmly offered to meet with Marbas and the others. Asteroth and the others ran down a long corridor that was illuminated with blue light. Opponents came running towards them from the corner of the corridor. Asteroth calmly took out a gun and began shooting at them. The bullets hit the enemy's bodies and heads directly. The dog-faced demon fell dead to the floor with his tongue hanging out. The heroes continued down the corridor. Marbus turned around, looking at the demon's corpse, and asked if these demons were really the ones who were trying to overthrow their father's rule. Asteroth, looking ahead, answered him that this was quite likely. The corridor finally ended and light appeared at the end. Asteroth and the others began to approach the exit of the corridor. Suddenly, she opened her eyes wide in shock. A beaten Baphomet appeared before her, whose body was covered in cuts and blood. Next to her, he saw a guy smiling widely. He was a thin guy in a formal suit, behind him were demon enemies. He held Baphomet by the hair and greeted everyone with a smile on his face. Astareth frowned as she walked outside. She named this guy Beelzebub. Beelzebub smiled and opened his eyes. His eyes were black. He said that they had not seen each other for a long time. Marbus tensed and pursed his lips, realizing that things were bad for them. Beelzebub placed his hand on his chest and smiled widely, saying that he was now the lord of the demon world instead of Satan. He began to convince them that he would rule properly and eradicate all the problems in the old system. Asteroth looked at him annoyed, frowning slightly, and was rude to him. She said that he is a lowlife who says this, and then forcibly manipulates the will of his servants just to use them as a tool. She looked at the crowds of demons with bags on their heads. Beelzebub looked at her from under his brows and said that the old system was a restriction in the name of freedom. All the heroes stood opposite him and his army. Beelzebub said that he cannot control everything and that is why he submitted to the will of the lower demons and will use them as pawns in wars. He added that with such power angels and people will bow to him. He opened his eyes wide and said in a mocking tone that he could not believe that Satan was so gentle. Astaroth put her hand on her hip, looking at Baphomet near Beelzebub's feet and said that they wouldn't get anywhere just by talking. Exhausted, Baphomet groaned heavily, blood was coming from her mouth and her chest was battered. Astaroth frowned angrily at her subordinate. She clenched her hand tightly into a fist, not saying anything for a while. Suddenly, she crossed her arms and ordered Baphomet to stand up, saying that she did not give her permission to worship this lowlife. Baphomet began to slowly open her eyes, it was very difficult for her. Beelzebub was still holding her hair. The girl moaned from pain and powerlessness. Beelzebub straightened his hair and said that he was surprised that she was still alive. Baphomet frowned and began to be filled with anger. She ordered to let her go, because Lady Asteroth was calling her. The girl turned her blood into many rocket bombs, placing them above the enemy's head. Beelzebub said with a calm smile on his face that an attack at that distance could kill her too. Baphomet's pupils shrank and she smiled madly and said she didn't care. There was a loud explosion and a bright flash of light appeared. Smoke was coming from Baphomet's hand, it was covered in abrasions and cuts. Asteroth managed to pull the girl out of the epicenter of the explosion and saved her. She smiled as she held her in her arms and praised her for her good job. Asteroth stroked Baphomet's cheek with the back of her hand, telling her to rest. Beelzebub began to applaud with his skinny arms. He hovered in the air, drawing one knee towards him, and said that he was impressed and this product of the old system made him sick. He narrowed his eyes and turned his gaze to Asteroth, asking if she herself was tired of this. Asteroth sat next to the exhausted Baphomet. 
Next to them stood Lilith, Uriel, and Marbas. Suddenly something made Uriel start to get nervous and tense. At this time, Lucifer was flying through the corridors, holding Satanasia on his shoulder. Satanasia tried to push the main character away, saying that he had calmed down and ordered him to be lowered to the floor. Lucifer looked at him irritably and said that it was nothing, and they were already near the exit. The main character frowned and said slightly tensely that he had a bad feeling. He flew towards the exit from where the wind was blowing towards him. He quickly flew out of the corridor, breaking out. Something made Lucifer tense and even slightly confused. He saw that all their allies were defeated and wounded. Asteroth's entire body and head were bleeding, and she could hardly stand on her feet. Marbas lay unconscious on the ground in a pool of his own blood. Satanasia looked at them fearfully, calling their names. Beelzebub's minions grabbed Eve and took her somewhere. The girl screamed and called Lucifer. The main character looked ahead discouraged and could not believe what he saw. Beelzebub hovered in the air, pulling his legs towards him, and said that there was still someone left here. He looked at the man in the jacket with the blue sword and asked if his friend had come. Lucifer looked at the man angrily and asked what he was doing here. This man was Michael. He looked arrogantly and coldly at the one he had betrayed. While Beelzebub was hanging in the air, Michael walked towards Lucifer. He straightened his long blonde hair that was flying in the wind and told the main character that they had not seen each other for a long time. Lucifer was angry, he looked at Michael with disgust and said that he had a lot of questions for him. Lucifer clenched his hand into a fist. He jumped up and swung, shouting that he would hit him first. Something from afar began to fly towards him. Lucifer, who noticed this, stopped abruptly and was taken aback. A cane with a red handle stuck into the ground right in front of his feet. Beelzebub, with a mocking smile in the air, said that his hand slipped. The main character aggressively shouted at him to back off and ordered him not to interfere. His pupils shrank with anger. Satanasia looked at Beelzebub and Michael, asking the demon what he was doing. Beelzebub smiled madly, he had a blank look. He replied that he also created an alliance for a single reason without separating demons and angels. He directed his hands towards Michael's neck. Beelzebub hugged him from behind, running a finger over his lips. He said that this fierce angel Michael is helping them in overthrowing and destroying Satan. He lowered his eyelids slightly, looking at Lucifer. The main character made a creepy expression on his face, his pupils shrank he ordered to remove his hands from Michael. Beelzebub smiled maliciously and raised his hands, sarcastically saying that he was scared. He suggested leaving this matter to the angels. The guy looked at Satanasia, waiting for his consent. Satanasia frowned slightly and looked at him displeasedly, but did not answer. The main character and Michael are left alone. Lucifer asked him why he was betraying him and their father. Michael's hair flowed smoothly in the wind. He silently looked at his former friend with his cold blue eyes. His silence angered Lucifer, and he shouted at him to stop just standing there and ordered him to at least say something. Michael smiled faintly, tilting his head to the side. He started laughing loudly. This made Lucifer confused. The main character looked at the angel with a frightened gaze. Michael said Lucifer is wrong. He asked if he really considered him a friend who trusted him and was willing to help. Michael's pupils shrank, he grabbed his hair with one hand and put the other hand on his chest. He smiled madly and said it was just a hilarious joke. The main character still didn't understand anything. He asked in a trembling voice what he was talking about. Michael's face went crazy. He grabbed his face with his hands and said that he always hated him because he was the best before Lucifer was born. Their father gave love to Lucifer, who was born with deformed wings instead of Michael, who endlessly tried to be an example of the heavenly apostle more than anyone else. Michael calmed down slightly and closed his eyes. He remembered how he and Lucifer were sitting by the lake. Lucifer had his red, huge wings behind his back. Michael admitted that he always hated those ugly wings, these words hit Lucifer hard. He looked at his former comrade in confusion. 
Suddenly, he closed his eyes and said that Michael was lying. Michael opened his eyes and looked at the main character with a cold gaze. He said that he always seduced him just to see his face at that moment. Lucifer's world seemed to collapse. He raised his head up doomedly, not understanding what was happening. Michael spread his arms to the sides. A magical blue light appeared in his hands. He said that if he could destroy the protagonist's soul back then, he wouldn't have to go through all these difficulties. But now he understands that it was worth it because he was able to look at Lucifer's face. A large magic circle appeared in the sky. Michael spread his arms wide and summoned Leviathan. A huge sea monster tail began to emerge from the magic circle. Lilith and Adam sat on the ground and looked in shock at the monster's exit. Leviathan, the sea serpent, completely emerged from the magic circle, and with him was an underwater knight with a trident. Lucifer jumped up from the snarling monster. The main character bared his teeth and frowned, shouting the name Michael. The angel looked at him coldly and slyly, without answering anything. On the other side, purple portals opened in the sky. Satanasia carefully descended from there and stepped onto the ground. From afar, he looked at the silhouette of Leviathan illuminated by the evening sun. All their allies were also transported through the portals. Lilith placed her palm on the bleeding wound on her arm. She asked if Lucifer could handle it alone. Satanasia looked into the distance, his bangs blowing in the wind. He said that they had no choice but to leave everything to the main character. Beelzebub appeared behind him, flying above him. He said he was glad he found it. He closed his eyes and began to laugh, saying that once he took Michael as an ally, he had a chance to take a step forward. He opened his eyes and looked down coldly. He said that Adam and the one with the magic eyes look useful. He asked if he should still pick up Marbas. Uriel kept his right hand on the wound on his stomach. He tried to cover Adam with his other hand. Marbus was still unconscious, he was lying on the ground. Beelzebub, sitting in the air, looked at the heroes. He said that he would like to take Adam, the first man, and the magical eyes from Marbus. He narrowed his eyes and smiled widely, saying that he would only take the eyes, leaving the body. Satanasia looked up and said that he did not know that he was the head of the anti-Satan faction. Beelzebub crossed his legs and turned his head to the side. He said that Satanasia is a desperate follower of Satan, but it doesn't matter because Satan's reign is over, and if Satanasia follows him, he will treat him accordingly. Satanasia got angry and jumped up, swinging his katana. He shouted not to order him. Beelzebub raised his head and looked at the demon with an absolutely insane look. Suddenly something interrupted Satanasia and he was taken aback. A loud explosion sounded in the middle of the forest, and the noise caused the birds to fly up and head in the other direction. A large purple portal appeared in front of the heroes. Uriel looked at it anxiously and asked why it was there. From the portal emerged Cherubim, a winged celestial creature with a core in the middle. One of the armor on the limb flashed brightly in the setting sun. A large dark portal with a funnel opened in the sky. Huge stone boulders were floating in the air. Satanasia stood on one of these boulders. Cherubim drilled into the ground, creating a crater there. Beelzebub smiled, standing next to the celestial being, and said that Michael offered this as a sign of a treaty. It can destroy a demon along with his soul, which is why the Heavenly Father sealed Cherubim. The celestial being opened its many wings. Beelzebub smiled madly, spreading his arms to the sides, and said that this was a special mobile weapon. Cherubim soared into the sky. Satanasia looked at him coldly, blood flowing down his face. Beelzebub's fingernails became very long and sharp. He looked at his enemy from under his brows and said that it was time for them to cleanse the Satan faction. The cherubim flying in the sky began to fire angelic sharp projectiles. Satanasia ran forward with all his might. He jumped down from the boulder, maneuvering in the air. With his katana, he deflected stones and boulders flying at him. One of the shells was able to wound him. Blood started pouring from his cheek. Satanasia was located directly above Cherubim. The core of the celestial being glowed brightly. The demon released its purple tentacles and grabbed onto the stone. 
He leaned against a boulder, trying to maintain his balance. A purple beam from Cherubim's core broke the boulder. Satanasia jumped down from there and prepared to attack him. He plunged the sharp blade into one of the creature's limbs. Purple blood gushed from the severed limb. Suddenly something stopped Satanasia and made him stop. It was one of Cherubim's wings and it prevented him from moving. With one movement of the blade, Satanasia cut the feathers holding it. Satanasia's pupils shrank. Blood was flowing from his forehead and there were deep wounds on his shoulders. He landed down and saw that the wing had dug into the ground. Behind the first wing, the second wing also stuck in. They were light pink. The wings began to rise, leaving behind smoking craters on the ground. Satanasia flew out of the purple portal directly above Cherubim. He struck the core with his blade. The black and yellow armor on the limb reflected the sunlight. The core broke and pieces of the shell began to fly around. Uriel smiled hopefully, saying that the core was destroyed and Cherubim should stop there. But unexpectedly a sharp feather pierced Satanasia's stomach. He clenched his teeth and tensed, letting out a muffled groan. He fell down against the background of the destroyed cherubim. Beelzebub grabbed Satanasia from the back and told him not to forget about him. He dug his long black claws into Satanasia's chest. After that, he slashed his claws across his body, leaving many deep and bleeding cuts. Satanasia closed his eyes in pain and blood began to flow from his mouth. Beelzebub looked with pleasure at the blood of his enemy. Satanasia began to fall down, exhausted. Beelzebub was floating in the air next to him. Lilith looked at them in fear and shouted the name Satanasia. Uriel was also confused. Satanasia fell heavily to the ground, sighing. Beelzebub turned his back to him. Lilith's pupils shrank and her mouth was slightly open. Beelzebub approached her, he had a completely blank look. He said that he had sorted out the problem and asked if she could give him Adam and Marbas, since she didn't want to end up like that. Satanasia lay on the grass in a pool of his own blood, his face covered in sweat. Beelzebub suddenly stopped smiling and noticed a purple glow. Several of Satanasia's spiked tentacles began to attack the enemy. With a calm and cool face, Beelzebub made a strike with his claws. The flesh of the tentacles was cut into several pieces and began to bleed. The severed flesh began to fall down. Lilith watched this in shock. Beelzebub smiled and turned his gaze to Satanasia, telling him that they, the demons, exchange their body parts to obtain the body of the beast. He asked which body part he gave to Satanasia. Satanasia tried to stand up, but suddenly his ribs crunched painfully. Beelzebub remembered that he made a trade for ribs. More and more tentacles emerged from the purple portals. Beelzebub said that he feels like Satanasia is mindlessly attacking instead of regenerating. He cut off another tentacle and asked how many were left. Suddenly, under Uriel, Lilith and Satanasia fell into a large purple portal. Beelzebub turned his back to the portal with displeasure, saying that it would not allow him to escape. The fog rose above the thick foliage of the trees in the forest. Satanasia tried to get up. Next to him sat Lilith, who called him by name. Uriel stood behind them. Satanasia lowered his head, blood flowing from his mouth and sweat dripping from his face. He began to pull the cherubim shell fragment out of his body. He threw the bloody pieces onto the ground, which fell with a ringing sound. Uriel held his wounded hand. Lilith continued to sit on the cold ground. Satanasia asked them to take a steroth and baphomet with them and ordered them to flee. Satanasia clenched his teeth, moving his bloody lips. He said Beelzebub is going to take Adam and Marbas, so he doesn't think he will go after the others. Lilith looked sadly at Satanasia and asked if he could escape with his powers. Satanasia held his stomach. He replied that this was not possible due to the limit on the amount of space that could be moved. He said that his stigmata is a pass to a dimension in which the distance traveled is proportional to mass. That is, a small cup can be moved a greater distance than a heavy machine. In addition, he can only open the pass next to him. He imagined himself opening a purple portal near a helicopter near a military base. 
Uriel narrowed his eyes and put his fist to his chin, asking if the passage could be divided into several parts to increase the distance. Satanasia said that this should not be done because Beelzebub is excellent at detecting demons. If they move short distances several times, they will be detected, but if they travel a long distance at a time, they will not be found. If they don't move to a place where he can't detect them right away, he'll still get to them. Lilith's eye twitched. She said that there is a distance at which they can escape from the enemy, but Satanasia cannot do this to everyone. Satanasia began to draw a sheathed katana from his belt. He said that if they ran far enough, he would use those coordinates to find the exit. He threw the katana into Lilith's hands. He ordered them to run until they were out of Beelzebub's detection range, but just within range he could send three men. Lilith grabbed her katana tightly and narrowed her eyes slightly. She asked if he was going to fight Beelzebub while protecting Marbas and Adam. She said it was reckless. He lowered his gaze looking down. He turned away with his back to them and said that he had no other options. Lilith looked at him in fear and doom. She looked at the black sheathed katana in her hands. The girl frowned and pursed her lips, tightly grasping the sheath of the blade. She stood with her back to him, lowering her katana, and said that she always hated him, but he should not die. Satanasia smiled faintly, lowered his head, and said that he also hated her and did not care about her. However, he asked that it be given to him. He got down on one knee. At this time, Lilith had already turned into a snake. She used her hair to grab the unconscious Baphomet. Uriel picked up Asteroth and flew up using his white wings. Satanasia narrowed his eyes and turned around with a serious face. He looked at his brother lying unconscious on the ground. Adam sat on the grass nearby and looked at Satanasia in fear. Beelzebub looked around and at some point noticed them. He approached Satanasia and smiled, saying that he had finally found him and his ability was annoying. Beelzebub turned his head to the side. His body was framed by white moonlight. He said he didn't care that the other four escaped because he could kill him at any time. Satanasia's costume was bloody. He pointed the sword at his enemy and said that his enemy was him and that was enough. He added that he'd probably be much busier after killing him. Beelzebub smiled mockingly and said that Satanasia is acting tough even if he is not Satan. Beelzebub prepared his claws which became even larger and sharper, they were black and red. He ordered Satanasia to look at him. He towered over Satanasia, looking down on him. Satanasia raised his katana with a serious face and said that he thought he had already won, but killing one of them would not be difficult. He asked if Beelzebub knew who he was. Against the backdrop of the dark sky, Beelzebub replied that he was Admiral Satanasia the youngest of the brothers who bore the name of Satan and also the most powerful. He said that he knew it and he was too much for him. Satanasia's pupils shrank and he pursed his thin lips. Suddenly something made him tense and taken aback. He frowned. Several golden-colored celestial creatures in the shape of stars appeared behind Beelzebub. He said that these were cherubim prototypes and it was time for the second act leading to his first and final demise. He brought his blood-red claws down. The hem of his jacket fluttered slightly in the wind. Satanasia lowered his head, he was breathing heavily. Suddenly he closed his eyes. A second later he opened his eyes. Satanasia was determined. While Marbus was unconscious, various thoughts appeared in his head. He imagined him tilting his head to the side. He was afraid of Satanasia because he takes good care of his relatives. Even though he said it was for Satan's sake, they are still free to do whatever they want. Marbus didn't even remember anyone telling him to do anything with his demon eye. He imagined himself looking from behind at the one-armed Satanasia. Marbus believed that it was his fault that he lost his left arm. He would like to have a proper talk with his brother. He asked why he wouldn't say anything, because he was also a demon. Marbus wondered if he is afraid because he won't say anything or because he doesn't know what he's thinking. He suddenly imagined himself sitting on a chair with his chest pierced by the tentacle of Satanasia standing behind him. Satanasia looked at his brother. 
Marbas raised his head and asked who he was. He couldn't see his facial features because of the bright light. Suddenly Marbas sharply opened his eyes, he woke up in a cold sweat. He crouched down and grabbed his head, remembering that he was with Michael and Beelzebub. The guy had a very bad headache. He began to remove his hand from his head and turned his gaze to Adam. The boy stood silently with his back to him. Marbas looked at Adam's frightened face and asked if he was okay and what happened. He looked straight and saw splashes of scarlet blood. He was horrified. Marbas looked very scared and confused. Beelzebub pierced Satanasia's body with its claws. Satanasia was bleeding from his mouth and looked exhausted and as if he was about to pass out. Beelzebub pulled his claws out of Satanasia's body and his opponent began to fall. Satanasia's hand holding the katana was grabbed by golden threads. His nails were also tied with gold threads. Beelzebub was breathing heavily and wiping the blood from his face with his palm. He said that Satanasia is really persistent. He looked at the golden cherubim spread across the ground and said that he didn't think the upgraded cherubim would be killed. Satanasia, bound with golden threads, did not answer. Beelzebub said that he had finally stopped moving. He grinned coolly and narrowed his eyes. He asked when he first felt that his body was dying and how it felt when death was staring right at him. Satanasia's face was covered in blood and sweat and he was having difficulty breathing. Beelzebub came closer to him and stepped on his opponent's thigh with all his strength, asking if his regeneration was not keeping up. Marbas clenched his teeth. He sweated profusely with excitement, thinking about whether he could do anything. He decided that with the help of the demon eye and invisibility, he could remove Cherubim's restrictions. Marbas looked at his bound brother, with Beelzebub and a huge Cherubim standing next to him, realizing that he needed to save Satanasia. With a silent smile on his face, Beelzebub turned his gaze to the side. He approached Satanasia, who was breathing heavily, and asked if he wanted to die. He said that demons are immortal, and as long as their soul is alive, they can receive a new body and be reborn. The only thing they lose is the memories from their previous body. Satanasia clenched his teeth and looked from under his brows at his opponent. Beelzebub said that he could destroy him and his soul with the power of cherubim. However, he smiled, raised his hand, and offered a deal. The tortured Satanasia frowned, looking questioningly at his enemy. Beelzebub put his hand on his chest and smiled madly, offering to hand over all 54 relatives to him. This made Marbas horrified. His pupils constricted and his mouth parted. Satanasia's look became devastated, he couldn't believe it. Beelzebub said that he could simply deprive him and his relatives of all their possessions, but that would be too troublesome. He started laughing loudly and ducked down. He said that if he handed over his relatives, he would guarantee him eternal life. He thought it was a good excuse, along the lines that he was in this position because of his relatives, who were a nuisance. Marbas shouted Beelzebub's name loudly. His hands turned into lion paws and he prepared to attack. Satanasia, who had his back to him, ordered him not to move. This made Marbas taken aback, his mouth wide open. He stopped and slid along the ground, kicking up dust around him. Satanasia used the right to command his relatives, and Marbas did not understand why he was using it now. He frowned and aggressively asked his brother what he was thinking, because at this rate he would be killed. He looked blankly at the immobilized Satanasia next to whom stood a grinning Beelzebub. A purple translucent scroll began to emerge from Satanasia's chest. He said that these are all 54 relatives. Marbas looked at him in shock, trying to call out to him. Satanasia lowered his head, his mouth and teeth were bloody. Beelzebub smiled widely and began to laugh loudly. The purple scroll began to crumble and dissolve. Marbas looked at him with stunned eyes. Satanasia said that he's dissolving all his ownership. He was still chained with golden threads and immobilized. Marbus had mixed feelings looking at him. He silently clenched his hand into a fist. The guy understood that it was natural for demons to use each other, because even he used the name Satanasia as support to do whatever he wanted. 
He was then sitting on the sofa opposite some upset man. Unlike Barbados and other demons, Marbas was only under Satanasha's wing out of convenience. The guy sadly lowered his gaze, his face was covered with long black hair. Beelzebub began to laugh immediately. He put his hand on his chest and asked Marbas how it felt to be abandoned by his master, in whom he believed so much. He stated that from now on he would use his eyes. His pupils shrank and he made a mad face. Marbas looked doomed, his eyes wide open. A large purple hand with glowing words appeared in the sky. Satanasia stated that he transfers ownership of Marbas of the demonic eyes to Lilith the serpent demon, and he also transfers ownership of his fifty-three relatives to Asteroth the dragon demon. Satanasia smiled faintly and said that's all. Beelzebub stopped smiling for the first time in a long time. A vein bulged in his cheek with irritation. A large purple portal appeared under Marbas and Adam, into which they began to fall. Marbas activated his lion paws and grabbed the edge of the earth. He tried to climb out of the portal and asked Satanasia what he was thinking about. Satanasia, with his back to him, replied that he thought that he could get along with Lilith. Marbas half emerged from the portal and aggressively asked Satanasia, hanging by the threads, why he was prioritizing them before himself. He shouted that he had never visited him. Satanasia was running out of energy. He said wearily that Marbas fell into despair and thought that he had been betrayed, and now he was offended by him. He asked what he expected from him. Marbas's face was sweating, he was angry. He shouted that he wanted a real conversation where he could get to know him better. These words surprised Satanasia. His eyebrows rose and his eyes opened wide. Memories appeared in his head. Marbus was sitting on a chair in the library with Satanasia standing behind him. Marbus said that he already knew everything and had lost his thirst for knowledge, he had finally reached the emptiness of omniscience. He asked to be killed. Satanasia grabbed the back of the chair Marbus was sitting on. He smiled and looked at him, saying that he could show interest in others, be they demons, angels, or humans, and then Marbas would understand that there's a possibility of one not knowing something. Marbas raised his head. He smiled faintly and asked to pray that the next one would be the same. Covered in blood, Satanasia smiled faintly. Beelzebub made an arrogant face and said that he was tired of it and was getting bored. He snapped his fingers and called Cherubim. The celestial being's purple eyes began to glow brightly. The tentacle protruding from Satanasia's back has been cut off. Marbas, grasping this tentacle, began to fall into the portal. He extended his hand forward and suddenly heard his name being called. Satanasia began to become covered in golden liquid and smiled sincerely. He said that Marbas still doesn't know much, but that's absolutely normal. The falling Marbas tried to grab onto something. He shrilly shouted the name Satanasia. The purple liquid in the portal splashed around. Marbas tried to reach out to Satanasia. He was unable to do this, and then he fell into the portal completely. Soon he found himself in the middle of the forest. A beautiful moon hung in the sky above him, and the sky itself was strewn with stars. Frightened Lilith and Uriel loomed over him. They looked worried. Marbas looked completely confused. His face was covered with sweat. He covered his eyes with his hand and began to scream loudly. He didn't understand why Satanasia did this. At this time, Barbados and Pruflas were sitting in the green garden. Ammon walked restlessly from side to side. Barbados asked Ammon to calm down. Each time, the bear was worried whether he would like the Satanasia tea he chose. A portal opened in front of them, from which came chairs, a table and cups with a teapot. On the table near the teapot there was a note from Satanasia. Barbados smiled and took the note in his hands, saying that he would read it. Pruflas and Ammon also wanted to know their master's answer. The note said, Thank you, it was wonderful. See you tomorrow at the same time. Satanasia placed the cup on a small plate. He had memories from the past. A beautiful house stood near the river, trees with lilac foliage grew nearby. Satanasia put a cup of tea on the table. He was sitting on a chair and reading a book near the window. Suddenly Proflas began knocking on the window with his beak. 
Satanasia opened the window for him and let him inside. Prufflas jumped onto the table with small jumps. Satanasia told him that he had become much smaller. He asked if he had come to meet his relatives. Little Prufflas began to nod his head in agreement. Satanasia lowered his head and smiled, saying that he understood. He began scratching the little demon's neck, picking him up and saying that Barbados and Ammon would be gone for a while. He asked if Prufflas felt lonely. Satanasia went with him to another room, opening the door. He entered the library, where there were many books. He asked if Marbus was here. Marbus looked bored and indifferent. His head was turned to the side. Satanasia took a step forward, books littered the floor. He continued to stroke Prufflas and smile. He said that Prufflas had become even smaller. Marbus smiled faintly, his face covered with long hair. He rested his elbows on the armrest of the chair. There was a purple aura coming from his head. He said that he already knows everything. Satanasia smiled awkwardly, lowering his eyelids. He said that he understood everything. Marbus's gaze was blank and uninterested. Satanasia was sorting through the books on the shelf and asked him how much he knew about demons. Marbus replied that he knew everything about them. Satanasia smiled, holding a book in his hands. He and Marbus simultaneously said they weren't sure about it. Marbus lowered his head, his hair shining in the lamplight. He said that this is the integrity of the future. Satanasia sadly lowered his head. He closed his eyelids slightly. Marbus sat surrounded by scattered books. He said that learning new things and knowing that there were many things he still had to learn was exciting in itself. This was what kept him entertained. But now he knows about everything. Marbus looked worried and upset. He said that he had reached the emptiness of omniscience. Satanasia narrowed his eyes and tensed. He wanted to tell him something with his mouth slightly open. He looked knowingly at Marbus and called him by name. Suddenly Marbus lowered his head and asked to kill him. This shocked Satanasia. Marbus begged him to do this because then his memories would be erased and it would help him start over. This puzzled Satanasia and even upset him. He got up from the floor and put his hand on the back of the chair on which Marbus was sitting. He smiled faintly and said that he could show interest in others. These could be demons, angels, and even people, because then he will understand that there's a possibility of one not knowing something. Marbus threw his head back. The corners of his lips turned up slightly, and he asked to pray for him so that he would become like this in the future. Satanasia sadly lowered his head and clenched his teeth. He said there was nothing more that could be done about it. Marbus smiled unhappily and raised his gaze, agreeing with him. Satanasia grabbed the back of the chair tightly, his palms sweating. Within a second, his tentacle pierced Marba's through the chest. Satanasia felt empty and sad. He lowered his head, looking at the guy's face. Marba's smiled, blood flowing from his mouth. He said that he was glad that Satanasia was so cold-blooded. His body turned into black dust. This dust began to disperse into the air. Satanasia leaned against the back of the chair, only Marba's clothes remained there. Satanasia tried to hold back his tears. He said in a trembling voice that Marba's knew nothing and did not even know about his pent-up emotions. Satanasia could no longer hold on. His tears began to drip onto Marba's torn clothes. He was left alone. He continued to shed tears and said that even demons can cry. After some time, he left the library and headed into the corridor. He opened the door of the room where Prufflas lay on the pillow. Satanasia told him that it seems like Marbas isn't coming back anytime soon as well. Prufflas tilted his head questioningly, looking at him. Satanasia pulled out a chair and began to sit on it. He said that he was afraid of death due to the loss of all the knowledge that he had stored within himself. He lowered the corners of his lips and said that he was sure that Marbus would be back at Raphael's place and he'll definitely get fed up then come back to him to be his relative. Marbus said that he wants to die knowing everything. They are immortal ideal creatures. An image appeared in his head of a dead Marbus whose lower body was torn open with bones protruding from it. Satanasia said that by repeating the same fate, they are nothing more than dead-beat creatures who have forgotten evolution. 
Sitting on a chair, Satanasia said that he was not going to die and forget the path that others had chosen. He stroked Pruflas on his white feathers. He looked at him and smiled, saying that one day everything will definitely change. Already wearing different clothes, Satanasia coldly looked forward from under his brows. Opposite him stood Lucifer, spreading his snow-white wings. The main character swung his sword and ordered to get out of his way. He jumped onto the back of Leviathan and was about to attack the Sea Knight. Michael was flying in the sky. He had six sky-blue wings. Against the backdrop of the waxing moon, Michael looked down, his wheat-colored hair blowing in the wind. The Sea Knight began to twirl his trident. With one hand, he pushed the main character away hard. Lucifer landed and rolled around a bit. He shouted that this isn't the time to be doing this. The main character frowned and bared his teeth, beads of sweat running down his face. He remembered that Satan's opponents had captured Eve. Lucifer got angry and quietly said her name out loud. He raised his head and saw a trident flying straight towards him. Lucifer managed to dodge by jumping back. The trident slammed into the ground, sending dust into the air. While Lucifer was in the air, Leviathan opened its mouth and was about to swallow him. This made the main character taken aback and surprised. Out of surprise, he dropped his sword from his hands. Lucifer grabbed Leviathan's upper fangs and pressed his feet against its tongue, trying to keep Leviathan's mouth open. The sea monster suddenly decided to ram the stone wall of a building nearby. Lucifer's back collided with the wall, causing him to lose his balance. One of Leviathan's fangs dug into the main character's shoulder. He realized that poison had been injected into him. Lucifer was able to escape the sea monster's grip. His face was sweating heavily and he clenched his teeth, not understanding what was happening. The main character began to lose his powers. He began to fall down and his wings became full of holes and could not hold him in the air. Below him was the open mouth of Leviathan. Lucifer fell straight into the sea monster's mouth. Leviathan swallowed the angel and closed his mouth. Suddenly, his green eyes opened wide. The monster began coughing up blood as Lucifer worked its way down its throat. The sea knight tensed. Michael narrowed his eyes, watching what was happening. A bright red flash of light and angel dust appeared. The sea monster's flesh was torn by Lucifer, who was able to get out with the help of his powers. His pupils constricted, and he began to grin. The main character looked aggressive. Torn flesh, Leviathan's snout, and the sea knight fell down into the sea monster's purple blood pool. Lucifer rose to his feet with the help of his sword. Michael came down to him from the sky. He tilted his head to the side and smiled coldly, saying that he was able to defeat Leviathan. The main character was covered from head to toe with the monster's blood. He breathed heavily and angrily said the name Michael. A blue magic circle and portal appeared under Michael's feet. He said that he had finished his mission, so he was going back. Lucifer frowned and aggressively asked what he was going to do with Eve. The wound on the angel's shoulder began to hurt sharply. This made him move and stop. The main character grabbed his bleeding wound. Michael narrowed his eyes. It was illuminated with blue light. Angel asked Lucifer if he hated him. The main character fell to the ground, holding his wounded shoulder. He looked at his enemy aggressively. Michael told him that he could hate and resent him as much as he wanted. He wanted his wings to shine brightly, representing the tinge of hatred. Michael began to plunge into the portal. He extended his hand forward, his hair blowing in the wind. He said that they would see each other in the depths of the earth. The blood of the sea monster dripped down from Lucifer's hair. He ordered Michael to wait. It began to rain on the battlefield, drops falling to the ground. Lucifer knelt down and raised his head, shouting Michael's name. Drops of rain fell on Marbus's thick black hair. Lilith pursed her lips and lowered her gaze, frowning. Lucifer fell to the ground alone. Raindrops washed away Leviathan's blood. The crystal in the chest of the main character said that acquiring the power of the fifth tier, Lucifer ordered him to shut up. Out of fatigue, he began to close his eyes, remembering his friends. He imagined that Marbus, Uriel and Lilith were looking at him, and somewhere behind stood Satanasia with his back turned. 
A bright beam of white light appeared in the sky. Tired Lucifer looked up, not understanding what it was. Before this, Uriel called out to Lilith, after which she turned to him. He approached her and raised his hand, asking if she had something that could be communicated between her and Lucifer, giving an example of a word. The girl looked at him worriedly, asking what he meant. Adam stood next to Uriel, Marbas sat on the grass. Uriel said that to reunite with Lucifer, he wants to use something that the rest of the angels will not understand, but there is one problem. He put his hand to his chin, imagining images of Michael and Beelzebub in his head. Uriel said that Beelzebub wouldn't care, but Michael is a problem since he is with him, so Uriel needs to further encrypt the signal and pass it to Lucifer. Lilith thought, putting her hand to her chin, thinking about something that only Lucifer and them could understand. The girl remembered something and had an idea. The bright white star in the sky continued to glow. The main character, raising his head, realized that this was Uriel's signal. He tried to peer into the star, trying to understand what Uriel wanted to tell them. Going through the options, he still didn't understand what they were talking about. Suddenly a sparkle appeared in his eyes, and he understood what they wanted to tell him. He dropped his shoulders in disappointment and said that this is Southwest Uni. He remembered Lilith talking about it in the car. Lucifer was able to fly with his weak, destroyed wings, saying that he still didn't understand what Uni was. Uriel and Lilith noticed something in the sky and sighed. They saw the silhouette of Lucifer's wings and a bright red light. The main character looked very exhausted and tired, his face was bruised and covered with sweat. Uriel smiled sincerely and put his hand on his chest. He was very glad that Lucifer picked up the signal. Suddenly something made him taken aback and tense. The exhausted main character began to fall down and Uriel ran towards him. Red hair began to flutter in the wind. Asteroth jumped and managed to catch the falling Lucifer. Lilith looked up at the sky in concern and shouted her name. Asteroth noticed something frowning. She landed carefully and placed Lucifer on the ground. Asteroth unbuttoned Lucifer's clothes and saw the infected wound. She said it was Leviathan poison. Uriel looked at her with concern and asked if it was normal for her to move around with such injuries. Asteroth smiled faintly and said that she slept for a long time, so most of her wounds healed. Despite this, blood began to flow from her hand. Uriel narrowed his eyes, raising his eyebrows. He looked worried. He approached Asteroth and confessed to her that when she and Lucifer made that contract, he did not fully trust them, the demons. The light illuminated half of Asteroth's face. Uriel told her that she risked her life to protect everyone from Michael's attacks. He turned his gaze to Marbus, who had his back to him, and said that Satanasia also saved him and Adam in the end. Uriel put his hand on his chest and thanked everyone, saying that he trusted them. Osteroth lowered her gaze and frowned. She looked at the exhausted Lucifer, whose clothes were soaked in his own blood. She remembered that the main character helped Lilith and Marbas when there was a battle with the demigod. Lilith sat down next to the prone Lucifer and offered to find cover in case they were attacked again. She looked at Marbas and asked if he had a villa nearby. He answered negatively. He closed his eyes sadly and said that he only did as he liked inside Santanasia's territory. Asteroth raised her hand and said that she had the perfect place to hide. A huge metal gate appeared on the ground next to her, surrounded by red lightning. Uriel and Adam were surprised and taken aback. Marbus and Lilith also looked surprised. The main character barely opened his eyes, not understanding what was happening. These gates began to open slowly and steam came out. Asteroth approached the gate and said that they were going to their homeland, Hell. Asteroth smiled while surrounded by red light and invited everyone to descend to hell. A strong wind coming from the passage blew Uriel's hair. He asked if they, the angels, could go there. Asteroth turned to her and replied that it was the only way out, although demons usually do not invite angels to hell. Uriel crossed his arms and said that they might not be accepted there. 
Asteroth clenched her hands into fists and replied that there was a risk, but this would solve the problems of persecuting Beelzebub, and Hell would be safer than here. Lilith was sitting next to the main character, who was lying on the ground. Uriel put his hand to his chin and said that he was right, and this was the only way out. He lowered his gaze, saying that they should go there, also for Adam's protection. He asked how Lucifer felt about this. The main character, with his eyes closed, answered him that he did not mind and would leave it to them. Osteroth said that everything is decided. She ordered Baphomet to check the security of the gate. Baphomet happily agreed. She was the first to jump into the passage to hell. Asteroth turned to Marbus and Lilith and told them that when they figured out that there's no problem on the other side, then they could go. He asked them to help Adam and Lucifer. After some time, all the heroes found themselves in a vacant lot near high walls and a fence. The sky was blue, the clouds were slowly floating. Lilith put her arm around Adam's shoulder and asked where they landed. Marbas held Lucifer. He replied that they were in one of the nine circles of hell, in the city of Dis on the fifth circle. Asteroth frowned and answered in the affirmative, saying that this place is for those who do not believe in the true God or for those who believe in other gods. That is, this is the city where their demonic companions gather. Dragons, mythical birds, and winged demons flew in the sky. The streets were full of both people and demons. Baphomet was wearing a black cloak. She handed the cloaks to the others and said that there were many demons and humans here, so it would not be difficult for them to blend in with the crowd. Marbus, Lilith, and Adam put on black capes. Baphomet approached Asteroth and whispered something in her ear. Asteroth put on her hood and asked Uriel to follow him, saying that there was someone he should meet. The protagonist's vision was blurred, he could hardly see the fan on the ceiling. He slowly began to open his eyes wider. He stood up a little, grabbed his head, and asked where he was. Lilith approached him and said that apparently the medicine that Asteroth and the others procured is working. The main character saw light from the window opposite which he was sitting. Lucifer looked confused as he looked at the view from the window. Demons and people walked along the street about their business. Lilith put her hand on her shoulder and said that this is Dis, the city of heretics and demons in the fifth circle of hell, and now they are in Villa Asteroth. Lucifer leaned against the head of the bed and said Dis looked a little like New York. Lilith smiled and said that they had come a long way. The main character lay down on his back and called Lilith by name. The girl tilted her head towards him and asked in a friendly manner what was the matter. Lucifer looked at her and asked why she was following him. The girl leaned towards him, smiling slightly, and asked what he meant. She narrowed her green snake eyes. Lilith closed her eyes and straightened her hair, saying that she feels like being by his side is the best way to reach Satan. The main character looked up in surprise, his mouth parted. He closed his eyes relaxed and said that now he understands. Lilith looked at the sleeping Lucifer with a soft smile on her face. At this time, Baphomet was at a shooting range with targets in the form of silhouettes of people. She put her finger on the trigger. After that, she began to shoot with both hands from pistols. All bullets hit the target's heads directly. She decided to reload the empty magazine of one of the pistols. Smoke came from the muzzles of the pistols. Marbas approached her from behind and praised her. He asked if they could talk during her break. Baphomet inserted a new magazine into the pistol. Baphomet lowered her head and asked what he needed. Marbus took out the Satanasia katana, which was in a black sheath. Baphomet turned around and asked if it belonged to the Admiral. Marbus took the katana out of its sheath, it was broken, part of the blade was missing. He responded affirmatively and said that Satanasia entrusted Lilith's katana to make sure they escaped safely. Baphomet sadly closed her goat eyes. She lowered her eyebrows and said with regret in her voice that she was unconscious after Beelzebub's attack, and she is only alive thanks to Satanasia, who risked his life. She turned around and looked at Marbas, asking what happened to that katana. She clarified whether this was a valuable memory of Satanasia. Marbas sadly lowered his head without answering. He closed his heavy eyelids for a few seconds. 
He handed her the katana and with a serious face said that he had a favor to ask of Baphomet. The girl turned to him and came closer to her. She removed her finger from the trigger of the gun. She looked at him from under her brows and said that she was ready to listen to him. Marbas looked at the black and gold hilted katana again and said that Satanasia had previously asked her to do this, but he asked if she could reforge the katana. Baphomet frowned as clouds floated in the sky behind her. She said she could do it, but asked why he would do it. Marbus's hair, tied in a ponytail, blew in the wind. He said that this broken katana would not fit into the sheath. He raised his head and turned his gaze to the girl. Baphomet looked at him sternly without saying anything. They stood alone at the shooting range with a one-story house nearby. Marbus admitted that he lied and apologized for it. The bright sun warmed the guy's pale skin. He said he couldn't believe Satanasia was dead. Perhaps he doesn't want to believe it, or he just believes that he will return alive. That's why Marbas wanted her to reforge the sword by the time Satanasia returned. Baphomet frowned, the strands on her head slowly fluttering in the wind. She said Marbas is serious about this. He put on a serious face and asked to do it again. The girl agreed. She put her finger up and said there was one problem. Marbas asked what was the matter. She looked at her clawed palm and said that she used too much blood during the battle, so she can only manifest the sword temporarily, but if they are talking about permanent manifestation, then her blood will eventually run out. Marbas understood her, he lowered his head slightly. The girl turned her guilty gaze to the side and said that this was impossible at the moment. Suddenly the girl's face changed and she asked in fear what Marbas was doing. He pulled the broken katana out of its sheath and made a cut on his arm. Baphomet's pupils shrank in shock. Blood flowed profusely from Marbus's forearm. He suggested using his own blood since it's cheap. Baphomet began to attract the flowing blood to herself, calling the guy a hedonist. She said that he was a relative of Satanasia. He was always playing around and that's why she despised him through and through. Marbas closed his eyes and smiled, saying that he would not comment on this. Baphomet said that he is a trustworthy warrior and she will accept his request. He handed the broken katana into her hands. The blood began to concentrate near the hilt of the katana. Baphomet said she would need time. Marbas sat down on the sun-warmed ground and said that right now they wouldn't be able to move anywhere thanks to Lucifer, so they have time. The girl's attention, something happened, and she turned her head. Adam stood between the one-story houses, examining his surroundings. Baphomet asked Marbus if Lilith should keep an eye on Adam. The boy continued to look at the buildings and houses. Marbus looked at him with a smile on his face and said that Lilith is busy courting Lucifer, so he is replacing her. He said thoughtfully that maybe the two of them are doing it by now. This phrase embarrassed the girl very much, and her face began to turn red. The blood given to her by Marbas compressed into a round clot. Baphomet said that he is a disgrace, and that is what makes him crazy. She asked if he really was a demon. Marbas made an awkward expression and said that he was leaving it to her, because he had drained quite a lot of blood. At this time, Asteroth and Uriel, dressed in black cloaks, walked through the streets of Dis. Asteroth frowned slightly as she walked straight and said that she heard that the angel Raphael is being held captive in a facility down the road. Uriel looked slightly worried and asked if Raphael was really there. They continued walking through the slums of the city of Dis. Asteroth said that she received information from her subordinates. Uriel said to hurry up, because the angel Raphael is in prison. When they arrived at their destination, Asteroth took off her hood and said that the prison was controlled by demons, so she would be the one who would speak to them. When she turned her head and saw the building they were heading towards, she was surprised. Before them appeared a luxurious white mansion with a beautiful garden. Asteroth did not understand what's the meaning of this. The girl gardener was watering the flowers when she noticed Uriel and Asteroth entering the mansion. The girl's pink hair was blown by a light breeze. She wondered if they were visitors. Before the demoness and the angel passed through the gate, they doubted whether they had come to the right place. 
Uriel looked around the mansion uncertainly and said that it looked more like a church than a prison. Astarath frowned and assured him that this was exactly the place. She narrowed her eyes and pursed her lips, offering to take a peek inside. The girl working in the garden put her watering can on the ground. After that, she took a step forward. Her feet were wearing shoes with small heels. The girl smiled radiantly and began to wave. She recognized Uriel and shouted that they had not seen each other for a long time. She asked how he was doing. This greeting made Uriel and Asteroth surprised and stop. The angel removed the hood from his head. He smiled and waved back, saying that Raphael was still the same as she was before, and he was glad she was okay. Ostarath approached Raphael and asked if she really was Raphael. She also asked what happened to the prison that stood here before. Raphael winked at her and pointed to the mansion and her demon subordinates. She said that prison is too dreary and dungeon-like, and that's too depressing. That's why she asked the demons to rebuild it. This confused Asteroth, she couldn't believe it. Uriel smiled awkwardly and said that Raphael has the ability to charm others. She can make everyone charmed into doing something for her. Raphael put her palms together and smiled friendly, inviting her to rest inside. All three were sitting in the living room on red sofas. Raphael sadly lowered her head, realizing the situation with Michael. She said it must have been very difficult in many ways. Uriel smiled slightly and asked to lend them her power. The girl smiled enthusiastically and clenched her hands into fists, agreeing. She said she was willing to help them in any way she could. A demon in a black robe with a white scarf approached her and called her over. He said another visitor had arrived. This puzzled Raphael and she turned her gaze to the servant, asking who it was. She walked through the large front doors outside. At the gate stood a man in a white suit, his hair was also white. This man was a demon. He had light horns. He said it was an honor to meet her for the first time. He introduced himself by the name Laplace. Raphael looked at him with a little suspicion and asked what he wanted. Laplace moved one hand back and placed the other hand on his stomach. He said that as a matter of fact, he heard that there are other angels here besides her. Raphael took out her angelic staff and hit the demon with a bright yellow beam, leaving a large hole through his stomach. Laplace fell to the ground in a pool of his own blood. Raphael smiled awkwardly and apologized to Uriel and Asteroth, since they may have been discovered and now they all need to escape. Asteroth and Uriel tensed and ran outside. Laplace stood up to him and said that it's not nice to suddenly blow someone away. Raphael turned around and asked if he introduced himself as Laplace. One of the demon's eyes began to close and veins bulged on his cheek. Suddenly his body began to transform. It began to increase in size and turned red. A huge demon with red skin and long white hair appeared before Raphael, Uriel, and Asteroth. He was dressed in clothes of white, black, and red colors, and a gold chain hung on his hips. Asteroth seemed numb when she looked at him. She recognized this demon as Baal. Uriel looked up in fear, realizing that this was the Prince of Hell. Baal bowed his head and said that he was pleased that they knew about him, but he would have liked to hunt them for surprise. Asteroth looked at him irritably and said that this must have been one of Beelzebub's doing. Huge insects began to crawl along the fences, resembling scalopendras and ants in appearance. Their sharp paws trampled the roses in the garden. Baal said he didn't care who became king. Uriel turned around worriedly and looked at the insects, saying that they were already surrounded. Suddenly a wide smile appeared on Asteroth's face and she began to laugh loudly. She took out her pistol and said that if he is so inclined, she'll do her utmost to crush him. She had another pistol in her other hand. Uriel looked worried and confused. Raphael readied her staff again and said that she too shall let loose after a long time. Baal raised his foot, causing dust in the garden to rise into the air. Osteroth looked at it and said it was the Magnolius Baal. She pointed the gun at her opponent and said that she would like to meet him one day, but not under these circumstances. Uriel looked confused and scared. 
He said that they only have one choice, and that is to kill Bale with their own forces. Raphael flew up and pointed her staff towards Bale's head. She released an attack from her weapon like a flamethrower. She stared intently at the result of her attack. The strike did not cause any damage to Bale. He swung his fist at Raphael. The girl lowered her gaze worriedly, realizing that the attack did not work. Uriel frowned and put his hands forward. He ordered his allies to close their eyes. Astaroth frowned and bared her teeth. A band-aid was stuck near her lips. Raphael looked worried, her hair falling into her face. Uriel aimed a golden ball surrounded by rings at Bale. A bright light emanated from this ball. Astaroth began to actively fire from her pistols. The shell casings fell to the ground with a ringing sound. Bale covered his face with his hand. Astaroth continued to fire with one pistol, as the second one ran out of bullets in its magazine. Bale looked down at her arrogantly. Astaroth frowned and clenched her teeth, frowning. She said that his skin is as hard as steel. Bale fist slammed his giant fist onto the ground. Astaroth managed to jump away, dodging. While in the air, she began firing her pistols again. Suddenly Bale punched her, and she fell to the ground with a crash, breaking the asphalt. Osteroth felt pain as her back hit the road, and she screamed. Bale glanced at Uriel, who continued to hold the ringed ball in his hands. After some time, the angel was surrounded by many overgrown insects. He did not notice how an insect with the face of an ant was about to attack him from behind. Raphael saw this and attacked the insect with fire. She looked at Uriel with concern and called out his name. Uriel, fluttering his wings, looked at her and said that he would leave it to her, and he would help Asteroth. Raphael, aiming her staff, shouted that she understood him. Uriel landed on the road next to Asteroth, calling her name. She began reloading her pistols and said that Bale's body was too big and strong, and they needed to attack it together. She asked Uriel to attack him using his powerful holy light. Uriel awkwardly lowered his head and admitted that he and Raphael were not specialized in fighting and could not move like Lucifer. Bale took a step forward towards them and swung his arm. His hand flew by and clenched into a fist. Osteroth crouched slightly, holding her pistols at the ready. She noticed that Bale grabbed Uriel and squeezed it in his fist. Osteroth bared her teeth and raised her pistol, starting to fire. The bullets began to hit the finger of Bale's hand holding Uriel. The enemy unclenched his fist and Uriel began to fall down. Luckily, Asteroth jumped in time and managed to catch the angel. Suddenly Uriel began coughing up blood clots profusely. Asteroth frowned and tensed, sweat running down her face. Raphael turned around worriedly, fluttering in the air, and called Uriel's name. The girl flew past the huge insects and headed to the ground. She landed next to Asteroth, who was holding Uriel in her arms. Raphael asked her to lower it to the ground and move away. Uriel was placed on the ground, looking in pain. Raphael pointed her staff at him, closing her eyes. Uriel's eyes began to slowly open, reacting to the bright light. He carefully began to stand up, thanking them both. Astaroth looked at Raphael with a serious face and asked if she was a healer. The girl responded positively to her, saying that she uses holy light to heal, so she cannot heal demons. Astaroth looked at her gun and said that her heal would become an attack if used on demons. Bale's huge foot rose above all the participants in the battle. At this time, Lucifer woke up abruptly, getting out of bed. He didn't understand what happened to him. Lilith looked at him and said that he had not rested enough yet. The main character gritted his teeth and said that something unexpectedly woke him up. The wound on his shoulder began to hurt greatly, causing Lucifer to hiss. Lilith raised her eyebrows in concern and suggested they go back to sleep. Behind them stood a stranger with dark hair, dressed in white clothes with a purple cape on his back. He smiled and crossed his arms over his chest, agreeing with Lilith, after which he said that the wounded man should just sleep away. Lilith turned around in shock tense. Lucifer reacted the same way to the stranger's appearance. The stranger had red eyes. 
His black hair was styled down and he was wearing a long white robe with a black suit underneath. Lucifer looked at him blankly and asked who he was. Lilith recognized her friend Samael in The Stranger. Samael said that his dear Lilith is right. He extended his hand to her and told her that he had come to pick her up. Baal slammed his foot onto the ground. Shards of road tiles and torn flowers flew into the air. The enemy began to raise his leg and the impact left a crater on the ground. Baal squinted and looked down with displeasure, not finding his opponents. Asteroth, Raphael and Uriel were on the grey domed roof of the mansion. They shouted that they were there. Baal stood with his back to them. Astaroth readied her weapon with a calm face. Baal turned to them and said that all their actions were useless because they could not even inflict a mortal wound on him. Astaroth pointed her gun at him. She agreed with him, saying that the weapon had no effect on him. She asked, saying, what if the bullets were filled with holy light from the archangels? Baal tensed, the veins on his face bulging. Astaroth frowned, her pupils constricting. She said it was a combination of human technology and angelic holy light. She bets even he hasn't had one of these. Baal clenched his teeth tightly, starting to get angry. He began to scream deafeningly loudly, his pupils shrank. Astaroth began firing her pistols. Raphael and Uriel stood on the sides, holding their angelic artifacts in their hands. Bullets with a bright green-red electrical trail flew towards the enemy. The bullets flew straight into Bale's forehead. His eyes rolled back and a large bleeding wound appeared on his forehead. He fell to the ground with a heavy weight, raising dust. The heroes continued to stand on the roof of the building. The giant insects began to fuss when they saw that their leader had fallen. Scalopendras began to climb over the fences, running away. Raphael, Asteroth, and Uriel all jumped down from the roof together. Asteroth looked at Raphael with a calm face and told her that the Magnolia's Baal was a truly a formidable opponent. She thanked the angels because without their powers she would not have been able to defeat him. Angel put her hands behind her back. Raphael smiled good-naturedly and said that she need not worry because she also saved Uriel, for which the girl thanked her. Uriel allowed himself to relax. He said that they actually saved him, for which he thanked them. Asteroth crossed her arms and said that they could no longer stay here, because she was sure that it was not only Bale who found them. She also claimed that the information was being distributed among the opponents of Satan. Raphael put her hands behind her back and listened attentively, as did Uriel. Suddenly, a powerful and bright explosion occurred in the distance behind them. Asteroth clenched her hands into fists and bared her teeth. Raphael looked confused and tense. Uriel said that an explosion sounded towards Lucifer's location. Suddenly something made Asteroth tense, she looked to the right. Baal's fist was advancing towards them, Asteroth tried to resist the pressure. However, Baal was able to close his fist, preventing them from escaping. A blue magic circle appeared under it like Michael's. A portal opened through this magic circle, and he was able to escape from the battlefield with his opponents. Lucifer was lying face down on the road. The wall behind him was destroyed. Lilith has already started to turn into a snake. She tried to call out to Lucifer, but Samael began to choke her and hold her back. He said that her lips should only pronounce his name. Lilith tried to break free from his firm grip. She ordered to let her go because they broke up 2,000 years ago. Thamel smiled and squinted, saying that it was so long ago that he didn't even remember it. After that, he said that Mr. Satan was no more. He hugged Lilith and stroked her cheek. The girl looked at him in shock and said that he knew about it. Lucifer raised his head with difficulty and ordered his release. Samael looked at him uninterestedly, narrowing his eyes. He pursed his lips and exhaled. The air flow pushed Lucifer straight into the wall. Samael wrapped his arms around Lilith's neck and grabbed her hand. He ordered the main character to shut up because he couldn't even protect the woman. Dust rose near the feet of Samael and Lilith. Lucifer tried to crawl towards them with all his might. Lilith looked at the main character in fear and shouted his name. 
Weak and covered in dust, Lucifer extended his hand to her, calling out to her. Her silhouette began to blur, she began to close her eyes from powerlessness. Just as Lucifer was about to grab her, Lilith and Samuel disappeared. The main character fell heavily face down on the floor. Marbas and Adam ran into the room. The demon called out to Lucifer and Lilith, asking what's wrong. Seeing Lucifer lying on the floor, Marbas became confused, asking what happened. The main character tried to get on all fours, cursing aggressively at Samuel. He lowered his head and screamed desperately in despair. Lucifer slammed his fists onto the concrete floor. Marbas and Adam looked at him in shock. The demon ran up to him, worriedly asking what happened. The main character lowered his head and said that Lilith got kidnapped. Marbas frowned and tensed, gritting his teeth and saying nothing. He looked towards the hole in the wall and asked if anyone else knew they were there. Lucifer, who was sitting near this hole, replied that it was the demon Samuel. This surprised Marbas very much. Lucifer straightened his back and started shouting obscenities about Samuel. Marbas and Adam looked at him worriedly. Marbas lowered his eyebrows, his pupils constricted. He said that it was impossible that he would miss such a demon. Lucifer frowned at him and bared his teeth, tusking. The main character began to slowly get to his feet, saying that it is not the time to be fighting among themselves. Marbas tried to stop him, asking him to wait. He once again asked to wait, placing his hand on the angel's back. From one touch, Lucifer fell exhausted to the floor, which surprised the demon. Marbas turned to him and said that he would meet with Asteroth and the others, and Lucifer should just wait. He looked at Adam, calling him with him. Seeing that the boy was scared, Marbas tried to calm him down, saying that Lucifer was just sleeping. They ran out of the house, Adam sitting on the shoulders of Marbas, who asked him to hold on tight. The main character barely got up on all fours. With the last of his strength, he began to crawl, realizing that there was no way he could sleep. Lucifer remembered how Samuel looked at him arrogantly and said that he could not even protect a woman. Just the thought of this caused the protagonist to scream angrily and rise to his feet. Marbus, with Adam on his shoulders, hurriedly ran through the streets of the city of Das. The demon looked worried and puzzled. He did not understand what was happening and how a demon, whose existence he did not know, was able to decorate Lilith. Adam looked calm as he sat on the demon's shoulders. Marbas realized that if these were Beelzebub's subordinates, they would have targeted Adam rather than Lilith. The guy's eyebrows were furrowed and a bead of sweat was running down his face. He understood that there was a lot of noise about Asteroth's location. He wondered if they were attacked at the same time by the same enemy. The thought of this drove him into despair and he clenched his teeth. Marbas ran down a dark and dirty alley, shouting that he didn't know anything, but now they needed to meet with Asteroth. The heroes reached the end of the alley and looked around the corner. What he saw made Marbas confused and tense. He ran to the mansion gate without saying anything. He and Adam looked at the ruined garden in front of the white building and Marbas again asked what was going on. Adam started hitting him on the head. The confused demon hoped that Uriel and Asteroth were okay. Adam again grabbed Marbas tightly by the hair and he suggested returning to Lucifer. When he turned around, he saw a man. He had gray hair, dark glasses, and slight stubble. He was wearing a white suit and a red shirt with patterns. The man was smoking a cigarette. Marbas tensed. He recognized his friend Belfegger in this man. Adam ducked slightly in fear. Belfegger smiled and picked up a cigarette, saying that they had not seen each other for a long time. Marbas looked at him suspiciously and asked why this pervert was still alive. Belfegger extended his hand to him and told him that this was cruel and that he should not treat a close friend whom he had not seen for years. Marbus brought Adam down to earth and said that he didn't remember them being friends. Belfegger threw away his lit cigarette and began to laugh. He said that Marbus was right because such a low-ranking demon could not be his friend. He narrowed his eyes and raised one eyebrow, asking to hand over the boy to him. Marbas covered Adam, asking him to stay behind him. 
He said that the fact that Belfegor is here means that this giant hole was made by Bale. Belfegor approached the tense demon and asked if he really thought he could win. Marba said they can't know until they try. The enemy lowered his glasses and winked at him, agreeing with him. He tossed his gold-rimmed sunglasses to the side. The clothes on his back began to tear due to the increase in body size. Stone protection with spikes appeared on his shoulders and his wrists were covered with gold. He turned into a four-armed monster with large horns and a long tail. Marbas smiled confusedly, asking what he should do now. Shortly before this, when Bale fell dead, the heroes were on the roof of the building. They jumped to the ground, surveying the destruction. Suddenly something made Raphael become confused and tense. Bale's huge palm grabbed them, the heroes tried to resist him. They failed, and the enemy clenched his hand into a fist, disappearing into the portal. He dragged Raphael, Asteroth, and Uriel with him, disappearing from the battlefield. Raphael found herself on the ground. She opened her eyes with difficulty. The girl carefully sat down, experiencing pain. She asked Asteroth and Uriel if they were okay. Uriel grabbed his head and said that somehow he was okay. Asteroth replied with a calm face that she was fine. The three of them stood in the middle of the wasteland, not knowing what to say. Asteroth decided to break the silence. She closed her eyes and said that she heard that Bale is immortal, and she has let her guard down. Raphael was unhappy with this. Lowering her eyebrows, she said that she should have said this earlier. Astareth began to look around, her hair blowing in the wind. She apologized and said that they, the demons, have their secrets and besides, she had only heard rumors about Bale's immortality. Muriel squinted, looking around. He asked where they were. All around them there was nothing but wasteland and dried up trees and low mountains could be seen somewhere in the distance. The withered walking dead man opened his mouth with rotten teeth and began to growl. Emaciated zombies with darkened skin and torn clothes walked everywhere. One of them was lying on the ground and tearing up the grass, eating it. Asteroth looked at them and concluded that this was the third circle of hell. Uriel asked if people were sent here for the sin of overeating. Astaroth closed her eyes and looked to the right. She said that it's gluttony, and those who commit it will stay hungry and wander for eternity. They looked at the many emaciated walking dead who were wandering mindlessly across the wasteland. Uriel said that it feels like genuine hell. Astaroth was on her guard, she looked at her allies and said that they had to be careful, because zombies could attack them. But something caught her attention, and she looked in the other direction. Among the wandering dead, she noticed the silhouette of a short elephant. This elephant had a golden muzzle and red eyes. This confused Raphael a little, and she asked in bewilderment if it was really an elephant. One of the hungry dead began to gnaw on the elephant's ear. Within a second, the elephant opened its gigantic mouth. He swallowed the dead man at once, leaving only his blackened feet. This made Raphael tense. Her eyes opened wide. Uriel and Asteroth were also shocked and tense. The elephant grabbed with its trunk another victim who unsuccessfully tried to escape. The animal began to chew several dead people at once, grinding their bones. The elephant began to noticeably increase in size. A dead man walked past him, trying to avoid a terrible fate. The elephant stood up on its hind legs and began stroking its belly. Raphael looked at him and asked if she thought the elephant was bigger than before. Suddenly, the animal noticed the heroes, looking intently at them. Basteroth gritted her teeth and turned around, ordering everyone to run. Raphael looked scared. All the heroes began to run away. Uriel turned around and said that the elephant is very fast. He attacked him with a red beam from a ring ball. Suddenly, the elephant opened its mouth towards a ray of holy light. He absorbed the attack and didn't even feel any damage. The elephant stopped and closed his eyes without making any sounds. Asteroth's face began to sweat, and she said that Uriel should not have done this. The elephant's paws began to enlarge, its veins began to bulge, and its claws began to become sharp. Raphael was frozen with fear, watching the elephant's transformation in disbelief. Uriel looked doomed, 
clearly regretting his decision to attack. The elephant's face also changed, it grew a beard and sharp fangs appeared. The animal turned into a ferocious and huge monster with giant horns. The shadow of the animal covered the sun. Asteroth stood in this shadow. She shouted that it was a hippopotamus. All three began to slowly back away, not knowing what to do. Asteroth said that it is a demonic beast that eats absolutely everyone and everything, including energy and attacks. The golden hippopotamus threw its muzzle up and loudly released a stream of air from its mouth. He opened his mouth wide and began to roar deafeningly loudly, spraying his saliva. The entire garden in front of the snow-white luxury mansion was destroyed, leaving a giant crater in the middle of the courtyard. Belfiger was the size of a multi-story building. His fist alone was the size of Marba's. He was wearing a black tank top and pants with gold detailing. The enemy furrowed his brows and narrowed his eyes, urging Marbus to join the fight. He raised one of his four palms with long black nails. With that palm, he hit the ground with all his might, saying that it had been a long time since they last played. He destroyed the road, but Marbus reacted in time and jumped away. Marbus used his demon eye and purple patterns appeared around his right eye. Belfegger made another attack with his fist, but Marbus also successfully dodged without taking damage. After the impacts of the huge monster, about four craters were left on the ground. Marbus used transformation into a lion, and his arms and legs turned into black and white paws with claws. He raised his head, using his demon eye again. Belfegger approached him. He scratched the back of his head and grabbed the spiked metal gate. The monster said that he had completely forgotten that Marbus could look into the future with the help of his demonic eye. Marbus himself stood in one of the formed craters. He smiled nervously and laughed, saying that he knew about it. Belfegger tore out the black gate and lifted it up. He grinned wickedly, looking down, and asked what about it. A fierce and cunning enemy threw down the gate. The metal gate flew past the confused Marbus. It flew straight towards Adam, who did not know what to do. The boy looked terribly scared and confused. He was petrified with fear. Marbus decided to protect him and stood between Adam and the gate. The spikes dug straight into his stomach. He took the brunt of the blow and started coughing up blood because of it. Frightened, Adam raised his eyebrows and opened his mouth, sighing. Marbus, despite this, was able to get back on his feet. Belfegger began to walk towards him, spreading his arms to his sides. He said that Marbus can handle any attack aimed at him. He picked up a large boulder from the ground with one of his hands. He took the stones in the other three hands. The monster fiercely threw stones, saying that he could not do anything with direct attacks that were aimed at the others. Marbus shielded his face from the rocks, blocking the attacks. A large boulder hit the demon directly in the stomach. The next stone hit the exhausted guy directly in the head. He lowered his hands, bending over. Adam looked at him worriedly. Marbus was breathing heavily and cursing, his face covered in bruises and blood. Belfegger grinned as he picked up another stone from the ground. He asked what it was. With all his strength, he threw the boulder towards Marbus, saying that he can't say that. The stone hit Marbus directly in the head, after which he collapsed to the ground. Adam covered his head with his hands. The cobblestone broke right through the wall. Marbus had many wounds on his head, from which blood flowed profusely. His pupils constricted sharply. He lay on his back and looked at the blue sky, through which translucent clouds floated. Slowly his eyes began to close as he began to lose consciousness. Memories of him lying on a leather sofa and reading a book appeared in his head. There was a slight smile on his face. Lilith approached him. The girl looked slightly worried. She raised her eyebrows and asked what he thought about doing something once in a while. Marbus thought that she shouldn't say this, but what could he do? He believed that he was a small fry living under Satanasia. Even if he tried his best, he can't do anything. Then, he dreamed of sitting at the same table with Satanasia and drinking tea with him. Marbus closed one eye and smiled sadly, saying that he could not do anything and had nothing to show the rest of the demons. Satanasia's hair was blown by a light breeze. 
he closed his eyes, raised his cup of tea, and said that Marbas is a capable kid. Marbas didn't know much about Satanasia, so he didn't understand why he cared so much about him. He believed that if he had been stronger, he could have fought alongside him and maybe Satanasia could have been saved. Marbas grinned and thought that there was really nothing he could do. He only needs demon eyes to evade Belfigur's attacks and he can't even protect one child. Then, memories of the battle with the mannequins appeared in his head. The main character then flew around and destroyed mannequins with his scythe. Lucifer turned to Marbus with a grin and said that he was counting on him, calling him old man. Suddenly Marbus opened his eye and loudly exclaimed that he was not that old. He was surrounded by a warm light. Adam looked at him worriedly as the light continued to spread. Adam placed his palms on Marba's stomach and chest, healing him. This made Belfegger look confused and he raised one eyebrow. He looked down tensely, removing his hand, unable to believe what he saw. The monster frowned and closed his eyes, clenching his sharp teeth. His face was sweating. Adam continued to spread a warm light over the body of Marba's, who closed his eyes again.